upon uh, Joel Longfield to lead us in a rendition of Old Canada. Sorry, I just noticed it was on. Oh, Canada, our home and native land, true patriot love in all thy sons' command. Carlton Ross, a porte le pea, is a porte la croix. Ton histoire est une épopée, tes plus Appreciate it one more time. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> Madam Clerk, are there any addendum or delegation items? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yes, there are a few items this evening. Uh, to begin with, the uh, Director of Planning and Development provided me with the, uh, an amended copy of the Meadow Heights Subdivision Agreement Amendment. Um, so as a result, um, staff are requesting for that item to be lifted. It's item four on your agenda in order for the Director to provide an overview of those changes and for Council to, um, uh, subject to Council's consideration, to approve that report um, and the agreement as amended. And uh, secondly, um, we have two delegations this evening that have requested to speak speak on um, item one and as a result uh, council may wish to bring this item forward for consideration uh, after the presentation section of our agenda has concluded if there is a, a will of council uh, we will uh, in fact bring item one of the council items for consideration forward and uh, here the the uh, delegates that uh, are relate there too Something of that, uh, look for a motion to confirm the agenda. Mr. Rodner, Councilor Doucette, all those in favor? Opposed? It's carried. Are there any disclosures of interest this evening? Yes, Councilor Penny. Mr. Mayor, in regards to the uh, presentation um, from Suzanne Johnson, um, because I am an employee of the NHS, and particularly at the Port Coburn site, I will declare a direct pecuniary interest if any questions regarding that. Thank you, it Thank shall you. be so noted. Could I entertain a motion to uh, adopt the minutes of the regular committee meeting of the whole 24-17 held on November 14th? Moved by Councilor Demery, seconded by Councilor Kenny. All those in favor? Opposed? It's carried. We'd like to now move to determination of items requiring separate discussion. And we have item number one, which must be discussed. Is there any further? Uh, Councilor Dimray. Item number six, please. Item six. Thank you. Any further items on my left councillor elliott yep. item four mayor for the uh, director of planning thank you any other items seeing none uh, call for a motion to approve those items not requiring separate discussion so by councillor <coughs> kenny second by councillor demery all those in favor opposed carried. We have a presentation this evening from Laura Domenicucci and uh, Lou Pompabianco representing the Italian Hall. Are they here this evening? <coughs> they want to come forward, please. Uh, thank you very much, members of council, viewing audience. It's a pleasure this evening to be here to represent the fire department on behalf of the city of uh, Port Coburn. 
the Italian Hall held a, uh, a Sunday afternoon tea, and uh, tonight they're going to be making a pre check presentation to us on behalf of the Italian Hall and their membership, as well as all the, as well as all the people that attended, uh, to go towards our fire safety or smoke alarm program in the city. So. Want to say a few words? Okay. Sure, sure. So uh, we had a really good turnout uh, a few Sundays ago in regards to this very important campaign for the Pro Cobra Fire Department in regards to smoke alarms because, uh, you know, if you got them, if they work properly, they save lives. It's very important. So uh, we're here tonight to uh, to present a check for $2,700 and change. Uh, and I could rest assured you as the president of the Italian Hall, every uh, cent that we got in was just transferred over to the, to the firefighters. So which is a well worthy cause. Thank you, Lou. Well, Laura, do you want to comment? <laughs> well, Laura doesn't want to speak. She's bashful. But, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Do you want to come up, Your Worship? Anybody going to take some pictures? Sure. Oh, well, there's our picture there. Just if I can while they take their seats, I'd just like to say how important this particular program is to the city. Uh, I'd like to also speak to the fact that uh, uh, just within this last month, uh, we've had two saves because of this program in which a uh, homeowner was alerted, one that she was sound asleep in bed, uh, she was alerted to the uh, alarm, was able to call 911. And another one uh, that happened recently in the, on the, in, in, within the city in which a neighbor heard the uh, smoke alarm and the two people were uh, roused by us as we broke into the house to get them up. So this program is very, very uh, worthwhile, and it is going to save lives and continue to save lives. So again, thank you very much for your donation. We very much appreciate it. And to everybody else who's assisted us over this last year. Thank you. Thank you, Chief, very much. And thanks again to the Italian Hall. Our second presentation this evening is uh, of our own Michelle Cuthbert, who's a uh, marketing customer relations and communications coordinator. And this is regarding the launch of the new Canal Days uh, logo. After 40 years, we've uh, changed a new, to a new logo, and Michelle will explain it. Again, it's our 40th anniversary this year, and it's also Inco's 100th anniversary. So Inco will be our, our charter sponsor, and uh, uh, we'll go from there. Go ahead, Michelle. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of council staff and the audience for being here tonight. I just wanted to kind of go over the process of determining the new Canal Days logo for our upcoming 40th anniversary. In May of 2017, the Canal Days Committee, along with the museum, we had a discussion and decided we would enter into an RFP process. With the Excuse me, Michelle, could you turn the mic on? There you go. Are we there? Yeah. thought my voice would be loud enough. <laughs> Leading into our 40th anniversary, um, as I was saying, to design the new logo. So we entered into the RFP process, and Brand Boulevard was chosen by the Canal Days Committee and staff to design the logo. They met with the committee, kind of came up with what the committee wanted to see in terms of vision and ideas. And items were around the fireworks and especially the well and canal, since they're signature aspects of the festival and the city in general. So moving forward, all communications and marketing processes will include this new logo. And with Valley being our title sponsor for our 40th anniversary, Brand Boulevard also worked with us to come up with a brand guideline for our logo on its own, but also a logo that incorporated Valley as title sponsor for all of our marketing initiatives moving forward. So Luca Valesquera, who's the creative director at Brand Boulevard, Brand Boulevard, created a little video to help explain the concept behind the logo and all the different aspects that go into it. So we'll just play that now for you to get an understanding. Hi, 
My name is Luca Valascura, Creative Director at Brand Boulevard. Brand Boulevard was commissioned to do the new Canal Days logo. This short video is to show you and explain the symbolism behind the logo. As you can see with the logo, there's a new color palette this year. The color palette is very bright, exciting, and festive. The reason behind that is to mirror the festivities of the event itself. Some of the things that the committee members on the board wanted to see were things like vessels of different types, fireworks, and the Welland Canal waterway, if at all possible. We were able to incorporate all three of these elements in this new logo. In regards to the vessels, there are no less than five vessels present in this logo. The first vessel is actually, if you take the entire logo and you draw a line around it, including the word mark, you'll see a large vessel. Then you'll see vessel two, three, and four here. And then there's the representation of a fifth vessel down here. Each of these, uh, each of these vessels are different. Now, we also have the representation of fireworks over top of the vessels here. And then the most exciting part is where the Welland Canal is. If you look at the negative space between the vessels here, you'll see a representation of the Clarence Street Bridge or Bridge 21, and you can see the Welland Canal waterway flowing underneath it. Thank you. Do any members of council have a question of the presenter? There being none, thank you, Michelle. Appreciate it. As per my opening comments, uh, we're going to deal with item number one at this time, uh, as there are two delegations <coughs> involved with that, and uh, then we'll re go back to the original agenda. So at this time, I call upon Mr. <coughs> okay, <laughs> we'll have uh, someone to move uh, item one and someone to second it. Moved by Councillor Butter, second by Councillor Demery. All those in favor? Can I read it out? I just want to get this. Uh, Show on the road? Okay. okay. Moved by myself uh, regarding the request of the Premier of Ontario to immediately appoint a supervisor to take over the operations of the Niagara Peninsula Conservation Authority. Whereas Port Coburn City Council is aware of the concerns in the community that the Niagara Peninsula Conservation Authority, NPCA, has demonstrated an inability to operate as an effective, open, and transparent conservation authority that respects its mandate. And whereas Port Coburn City Council is concerned that a recent decision to reduce staff will have a negative impact on the NPCA's ability to protect, preserve, and rehabilitate lands in the watershed area, and whereas the Port Coburn City Council has lost confidence in the current board and management of the NPCA, and whereas each of the local area municipalities <coughs> contributes funds through the levy in Niagara to the NPCA, and therefore a high level of accountability to the citizens of Niagara is expected. Therefore, the Council of the Corporation of the City of Port Coburn re resolves as follows that the City of Port Coburn respectfully requests the Premier of Ontario to immediately appoint a supervisor to take over the operations of the MPCA and that if said supervisor is not appointed within 60 days, the board be dissolved and be replaced by directors appointed by the members of the lower tier municipalities based on skill set, not politics or political ties, and that the Niagara region develop the process with stakeholders to be in place after the 2018 municipal election. Thank you, Mrs. Butters. Um, our first delegation for 10 minutes in total, there are three individuals listed, Mr. Ed Smith, Mr. Albert Garofolo, and Mr. Robert Melnkoff. Could you gentlemen come forward? And it doesn't matter who speaks how much, you've got a total of 10 between all th three of you. And uh, after 10 minutes, I'll have to cut you off. Understood. <laughs> yes? Does, don't each, doesn't each person get 10 minutes no. on both sides? Each, each delegation gets 10 minutes. Each person is separate, though. Uh, Madam Clerk, can you give a comment, please? 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, the delegation was registered as a group of individuals, and so um, they're not, they haven't registered as individuals themselves, rather um, Mr. Smith registered, and then he indicated that he wanted to have a couple of uh, technical advisors also uh, attend. So similar with the MPCA, um, they've been provided with 10 minutes to make their presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, uh, councillors, ladies and gentlemen, all the protocol of this of this council is respected. So we're here tonight to speak to you on the reasons why we believe that a, a provincial supervisor is required at the MPCA. Uh, I, I want to start, first of all, by giving you just a, a very quick overview on the mandate of the Conservation Authority. And this is taken directly from the Conservation Authorities Act, which is the provincial policy statement that governs them. Um, I won't read it all because of time constraints, but basically they're responsible for conservation, restoration, development, and management of natural resources. This is the mission statement that the MPCA has developed for itself. The, the concern that I have with their mission statement is they have thrown in the word economic needs. They have given themselves, so I've heard them talk about mission creep in the past. Um, they have given themselves the responsibility for, uh, for deciding the ec economic needs of Niagara and where the balance is for that between their mandate from the province and uh, the economic needs. And I think this is where the problem has crept in um, as far as the Conservation Authority is concerned. I will say that the Conservation Authority does not have any experts on the economic needs of Niagara on their staff. Um, they have environmentalists, they have biologists. Uh, perhaps tellingly, they have uh, three communications people. They have more communications people than biologists or, or ecologists. So why do we need a supervisor at the M MPCA? Basically, it boils down to those three words, transparency, integrity, and accountability. You add them up and you get the public trust. And they do get $8 million of direct local funding, and that's a, a, a rounded number per year. Uh, if you add in provincial and, and federal money, it, it creeps closer to $10 million. Um, and of course, with that money, they, have, they are our environmental advocates for Niagara, which I just happen to believe, and I believe that a lot of people in Niagara believe, is one of the most important functions um, for any organization to have. They are here to make sure that Niagara stays beautiful and green, those, part, those parts of Niagara that are supposed to be, stay beautiful and green and are managed well. Uh, also, their, their responsibilities of, as employers. I think we've all heard, and again, time constraints won't allow me to go into much detail, but the, uh, the staff turnaround at the MPCA um, has been significant. Another issue, using the, the use of public funds. So they have used public funds to hire a lobbyist, and that concerns me as a taxpayer. I don't understand how my government takes my money and hires a private lobbyist to lobby for a private development. So that, uh, that alone disturbs me. What disturbs me more, though, is that when you ask these questions, these are the responses that you get. And if I could get the video to play, please. I, and again, I have to correct the public record because it's not the MPCA proposing that that's how biodiversity offsetting should work. The MPCA has only commented to the province's position of no net loss. And they have commented, and I, I know you, you've seen what those comments are. So the MPCA has taken no position other than if that's what you want to do, province, then these would be our recommendations before any of that would ever be considered. So again, I just want to correct you when you say that the MPCA thinks that they can do this, they can do that. All the MPCA has done is comment to the province's position of no In fact, sir, no, that, that, again, the premise is wrong. Um, the MPCA, the, the CAO, and the chair of the board have gone publicly into the media many times, reassuring people. And in fact, I, and if I'd have known that the question was going to come, I could have brought an article out of the Welland Tribune where the CAO is saying, we are lobbying the government to allow us to do this pilot project projects here in, um, in in Niagara. So it, it is not... Um, and again, I will correct the public record. You say that the MPCA 
is not actively lobbying. What the NPC has done is supply comments to the province's position of no net loss. That's what we've done. Okay, so there you hear the chairman of, of the MPCA board uh, saying, and at the time I think he was actually the vice chair, saying that we are not actively lobbying. We ha all we have done is provide comments to the province. Um, at that time, I had the lobbyist contract in my pocket. It didn't fit into the, into the bigger picture at the time, so I didn't expose it. This is the lobbyist registry uh, from the Office of the Integrity Commissioner, a, a provincial office. The top line, Mark Keeley, Keeley & Associates, Niagara Peninsula Conservation Authority. It is the law that they, that they register as lobbyists. This is the document that was sent from Carmen D'Angelo, the then CAO of the Conservation Authority, to Keeley & Associates, tell it, instructing them what they were to be lobbying for. And the top line, the focus pilot project on four areas, thundering waters in Niagara Falls. So they are lobbying for private development. And this is the document that they sent to um, NDP provincial leader Andrea Horvath trying to set up a meeting saying we would like to talk to you about an exciting new project we have located in Niagara Falls. This is from the MPCA. They don't have any exciting new projects to lobby on except that they're lobbying for the development at Thundering Waters. The other thing, the other reasons that I think we need um, provincial expense claims, claiming $742 for lunch at the keg claiming per diems and claiming a lunch on the same day. Commonplace to claim two to three per diems per day. So if I could just spend 10 seconds on that, I'm talking about two to three per diems per day. They're going to tell you, yes, they have a regulation and I have it here. It's regulation 9.2 in their board uh, governance documents. It says they are allowed to claim a per diem per meeting. And meetings for them mean uh, staff barbecues, telephone calls from home, they track the number of meetings per day and they get to define what makes a meeting and then they claim a per diem for each one of those. So they, we have the uh, claim records and they're claiming up to three per, day, per diems per day and being paid with taxpayer money. Staff barbecue, gala dinners, the fire and ice event of bar party in Fort Erie, golf tournaments, fundraising barbecued, wild game dinners, wetland and jazz events. These are the things that they are claiming, not claiming expenses for, but per diem. They're calling these meetings and getting a $75 per diem every time they attend one. Whoops. I think I had one more quick video. Uh, uh. You had now contacted the Auditor General as we requested and that they are not available, but is it not true that early on in the process the Auditor General contacted you and offered to do it and you turned her down? No, that's not true. That's not true. Is it not true that she offered to do it? It's it's true that she contacted us and what she proposed was a path forward um, through legislation. Um, she could not do it under her mandate. Uh, as you know, um, the conservation authority boards, uh, as well as municipalities, are not within the purview of the Auditor General. My own personal opinion, I think any board, uh, any municipal council, uh, any uh, governing body that is in receipt of provincial dollars should be um, under the mandate of the Auditor General. But unfortunately, that's not the case right now. What the so that's the words of, of again, the, the chair, uh, Sandy Annunziata, at St. Catherine City Council just about a month ago, saying it's not true, that the Auditor General did not offer a uh, audit. We now have the transcription from that meeting with the Auditor General, and no less than two, uh, two or three times, depending on how you interpret the wording, she offered not only to do the audit, but she was stressing that it wouldn't cost Niagara taxpayers anything. She had a team ready to go, and her, her window of opportunity was limited, that if you don't take me out, and it was, it was communicated back to her, I think the date was February 14th, was the next board meeting, she said, I can wait till then, but I gotta know. And yet here we have the chair of the MPCA board standing in front of St. Catherine City Council saying, it is not true, she did not offer that audit. This is an, um, an email from the mayor of Hamilton, also talking about the audit. Excuse me, Mr. Offered. Smith, that you've got about a minute and a half. Thank you. I'm almost done. So I guess my point in the Auditor General is a free audit was offered and was turned down.
Conclusion, accountability, integrity, and transparency. These are the, as I said, this is vital. This is, we are talking about public trust issues. The board has shown an unwillingness, an inability, I don't know what it is, but it has been three years with the board. Um, an Auditor General is now coming in. We need to have a provincial supervisor in charge of that place when the Auditor General, the one thing to understand is that an Auditor General's audit is friendly in nature. Um, I'm not going to put myself out there as an expert on these things, but I know that it is done in consultation with the controlling board. Um, if we want, if we're after true transparency and accountability, we need a complete hands-off audit, and that means we need a provincial supervisor. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Smith. I'd ask members of council if they have any questions of so the presenter. Mrs. Butters. Well, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, the, through you to Mr. Smith. Uh, Mr. Smith, is there anything else that um, concern, any other concerns that you may have that warrant the consideration of a provincial supervisor? And I'd like you to make it clear, in your mind at least, what the difference is between a, a, that supervisory role and an auditor role. Uh, thank you for that. Yeah, there, there is some um, other areas of concern for me, and I, and I do have... First of all, I've been shut down for my freedom of information requests. So uh, shut down, meaning the MPCA has labeled me as frivolous and vexatious and will no longer process any freedom of information requests from me. Um, so that, to me, that speaks about their willingness to, to have transparency and accountability also. So... Um, the first one they shut me down on was when I requested the expense claims of David Barrett. So to, to your question of what is the difference between uh, the Auditor General and a Provincial Supervisor. The Auditor General, uh, again, and, and I'm really hesitant to put myself out there as an AG expert because I'm not, but as I understand it, the Auditor General is, works with you very interactively and allows you to guide her processes. Um, which can be fine if you're looking to, I don't know, it, it can be fine. I guess obviously it can be fine. I've never been involved in one. But also, if you have things that you'd prefer the Auditor General not to look at, and this is, again, me speculating, and if you have, a, if you have somehow an input in that, it's, it can be possible to avoid certain issues. And there are certain issues that I know need to be looked at within that organization, including the... the uh, the relationship between the Conservation Authority and the Conservation Foundation. There are many issues that need to be looked at. Um, so they've also denied me to see the expense claims of all the board members. Six months ago, they gave me two. When I, that's all I requested, or maybe it was three. Um, then I saw all these per diems, and, and my radar started to perk up, so I, I requested all the board members. I, just, I said, I want to see it all, and they're, they're denying that. They've, they're denying the paperwork into the Lake, Lakewood property, Printing done within the organization, OMB submissions that, uh, that approve their, their expense rates and things like that. They're denying a lot of paperwork. Other issues, um, of course, we have the Welland Mayor um, saying that he believes OPP investigation may be warranted. I don't know how that got glossed over so quickly. This is a mayor. This is a mayor that sits on that board saying that he believes an OPP investigation may be merit, uh, warranted. Hiring from the board into management, which includes okay, David Barrick and Carmen D'Angelo. I think taxpayers want to know, is that legal? Is that, is that integrity? Unsolicited contracts with board members. Regional Councillor Barrick has been promoted and moved into positions that were unposted. Refusal to expose documents on the censure of an elected official, a highly regarded elected official. Refusal to, to release those documents. Um, and the FOIs and everything else. Mr. Smith? Yes. Um, your response to the question asked is covering a far-ranging field. In fact, you're making a, a second 10-minute presentation. I can end it right I there, ask, Mr. Mayor. I would ask that the questions posed to you by any member of council be directly answered. You don't have to go into all this elaboration. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I hope that answers your question, ma'am. Do you have additional questions, Mr. Levers? Yes, I do. And I want to make it clear that I did ask Mr. Smith if he had any other concerns. And if they were his concerns, I think he has every right to 
um, put them forward in the way that he did. So can you I be understand. More direct in your questions. I then? can try to be. I can certainly try to be. Um, I would like to also ask you um, if there, if there is a supervisor, if there was a supervisor appointed, what um, do you think that that would be enough to um, delve into and clean up? some of the things that you've brought forward and um, MPP Forrester's brought forward and um, MPP Bradley and MPP Oosterhof also were supportive at the legislature on. Do you think a supervisor would have that opportunity to clean up some of these issues? Yes, ma'am, I do. I think that a supervisor um, and along with the Auditor General look uh, will let us know what exactly is going on and what needs to be straightened out in that place. And Thank to you, follow Mr. up, if there would be, if it's a one or the other kind of thing, then um, do you think that's going to happen just under the purview of an Auditor General re, uh, investigation or, or forensic audit? I, I'm not sure that I'm qualified to really know. Okay. Um, so I, I, it would be speculation. I've never dealt with the Auditor General. Me neither. Uh, yeah, so I, I don't really know. Okay. How far afield they'll go. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Okay. That's all for now. Councilor Kenny. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Mr. Smith. Thank you for, for your presentation. I appreciate it. I just want to know like, we seem to have uh, a big interest in the Conservation Authority. How do you think they're doing in regards to upholding their environmental mandate, which really, in my opinion, and obviously your opinion, is the uh, main reason for the Conservation Authority? Well, actually, in Albert is more the environmental, okay. um, and that's why I asked him to stand here in case any environmental questions. Well, then I'd ask that so, question of him then. Okay, thank you. This is uh, changing. Yeah. Right there, the right one changes. This should be. So, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor, Council. Uh, Albert Gruffalo here. I, I'm a former member of the uh, region, uh, the Conservation Authority's uh, Community Liaison Advisory Committee. Uh, I represent the uh, local nature clubs and environmental organizations. However, I was recently not reappointed to the board and I was replaced. Uh, that, that environmental sector no longer exists. So the environmental communities and nature clubs no longer have uh, representation on that committee. Instead, there's a new conservation uh, sector that was added and uh, a new member is representing that, which is not a member known to any of the nature clubs or <coughs> environmental organizations locally. Uh, so. My background is uh, in ecology, and uh, and I, I know the Conservation Authority has has mentioned, uh, uh, for instance, you know some of their their, their track record on uh, some of their policies has been. Uh, um, uh, there's many situations. There's Coil Creek here. There's uh, there's situations where we've seen forests lost in Niagara, and uh, many of these things continue to go on uh, without uh, uh, the planning process. Uh, um, there's some questionable planning uh, processes that. Uh, um, uh, you know, I, I think we need better, more answers to, and this would speak to something a supervisor could do in that position. So, uh, a supervisor coming into the role uh, could then answer many questions which uh, were brought to me as a, as a member of the Community Liaison Advisory Committee, uh, members from residents on Coil Creek, where there was obvious uh, fill that was placed in a wetland on, in a valley. Uh, you can see the fill next to the subdivision development, which was extended into uh, a wetland. Uh, another example is uh, I won't I, I, I won't I think there's another example is uh, many of our Carolinian forests some of our most significant Carolinian forests in Niagara rather than uh, being protected many of the most important uh, forested areas in the country today um, uh, have been lost and are continuing to be lost oh, you know since settlement time we've lost a lot of the forests in this area about 94 percent of upland forests we've lost. Um, Many of the forests in Niagara are original stands of Carolinian forest. Uh, Carolinian is the southernmost part of Canada, the most biodiverse part of Canada. 40% of uh, um, uh, the plants in Canada occur in this small area. Uh, it only covers 0.25% of the country, but 25% of the population live here, and it's the highest number of species as risk as a result. So many of these areas are under great pressure. Uh, here's just an example uh, of a number of areas. These are original forests that were uh, remnants of Carolinian forest. You can see a 1934 air photo here. That was a, the area circled in red was a forested area, an original stand. We've also lost about 85 well over 85 percent of our uh, pre-settlement wetlands Excuse and here you can Mr. see Garfell. wetlands and loss. Yep. Mr. Garfell, you're going on at length regarding certain situations, but is this the responsibility, has the Niagara Peninsula Conservation 
Conservation Authority directly caused this? The Conservation Authority is required to uh, protect uh, significant, uh, significant wetlands yes. and significant uh, woodlands. Uh, so these are a series of examples. Here you see another significant woodland, which was, uh, you see uh, an area on the left where there was a forest that was there, no longer is there, development is on it. But Here's is that, another significant forest. Is that the forest. fault of the Conservation Authority? The <laughs> only regular, there, there's a one window approach. There's a one window approach in planning uh, for development processes. And that one window approach uh, requires the Conservation Authority to comment on and protect provincially significant wetlands or significant woodlands. And uh, that process should be as well as species at risk. So the only opportunity for a comment on that or for protection in, the, in that regards is through the Conservation Authority. Uh, in many situations which I'm highlighting here, that has not occurred. We have, we've seen loss and we see uh, habitats of species at risk continually lost. Here's another one. Here's, here's another one on Merritt Road where we're seeing clearing happening in habitats of significant species. So there's a number of areas, another one in, in, in Niagara on the Lake. So these are areas where either the tree bylaw or provincial policy needs to be taken into account uh, or the uh, significant woodland policy of the provincial policy statement need to be taken into account. These are not being done. Instead, we're seeing over and over again, we're seeing situations like this. Uh, just going shopping the other day at Sobeys in Welland, I saw another forest uh, cleared uh, right behind, beside Sobeys uh, on South Pelham. So uh, a number of forests are being cleared and uh, provincial policy and, uh, and wetland policy, all these things which, the con which is the one window approach of the Conservation Authority to protect uh, does not seem to be happening. Uh, so for these reasons, a supervisor at the Conservation Authority could give more direct answers because when landowners approach the Conservation Authority, they're given answers like, well, we know that that happened, uh, we know that whole area got cleared or that area was drained and is no longer, that was a wetland but it's, it's got a pipe in it, for instance, and it's being drained. Uh, but what we, all we can do, we can't do anything right now, this is a typical example uh, of an answer, but we'll have to let the development go through and only through the development process and the planning process can we then try to affect some change here. I think that's backwards. I think it's important to look at their mandate. It's important that the organization gets back to their mandate. And I think the only way to do that is through supervising. Thank you, Mr. Garifold. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your answer. Appreciate that. Thank you. Ms. Kenny, you have no, a, a Okay. Mr. Maine. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, for the opportunity. Uh, Mr. Smith, uh, have you had any dealings with Thundering Heights? They, uh, Thundering Place. waters. Thundering waters. Or? Uh, yes, sir, I have. So, and, and one other thing I should say in all transparency, I've also been sued by the Conservation Authority. That, <laughs> that Mr. lawsuit Mr. has Smith. just ended. Mr. Smith, that's not a response to a question. He asked you had, you had any of them. Sir, I'm about to answer a question. And he, that's not an answer to the question. He wanted to know whether you had any involvement with thundering waters. Oh, go. There is an answer to that, and you said yes. We don't. Yes, I have had. We were not interested in rehearing yes, this case that you had uh, last week, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, my reasoning is, uh, I'm old enough to realize where the green belt started and where the green belt's going. Uh, it's, it's all buildings now. It's all businesses. It's not fruit land. It's tender fruit. Uh, and I'm a supporter of the NPCA, definitely. Uh, but. Uh, my issue with the supervisor and the auditor part of this is if you have a supervisor and uh, could he not work or, or her work under the uh, auditor general? What I'm trying to say is do we put the supervisor ahead of the auditor general or do we put the auditor general on the top of the supervisor. Which could come first, the chicken are or the Are you talking egg? chronologically or are you talking in, in chain of command? Chain of command. In, in chain of command, the way, I, the, the way that I would view it is that the supervisor is the supervisor of the MPCA. The Auditor General comes in in an assistive role to try to help you straighten out your processes and identify where you're not meeting your mandate. But, but they do it collaboratively. And, and they look at your books and they look at everything and they, they identify your, your structural weaknesses. Um, but you need reliable supervision in place. Yeah, I understand that. And I, I thank you for that answer. But my issue is with the Auditor General coming too far away, like uh, say it's another year from now or whether it's after the next provincial election. How do you get the supervisor in place doing all this stuff that 
actually the Auditor General should be working on and mandating it to make sure it happens. It's like, to me, it's like putting the cart before the horse. I'm sorry. Again, I, I would say this, that in, in circumstances where provincial supervisors have been inserted, and I don't think it's ever been done in a conservation authority, to be clear, um, but they have been done in health systems and things like that, these supervisors are subject matter experts. So they are able to start the corrective process upon their appointment. They don't have to wait for the Auditor General to, to intervene. The process of correction can start with the appointment of a supervisor. When the Auditor General arrives, then it just more or less would dovetail. Again, this is the world according to Ed Smith. So, uh, thank you, Mr. May. That's just it. <coughs> to my uh, left, are there any questions? Mr. Bonder. Thank you. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, to Mr. Garofalo. Gar um, so I didn't hear you answer the mayor's question. You just kept talking. Um, are you claiming that the NPCA is responsible for 84% of the loss of the Carolinian force in our area? No, I mentioned... And can you give us a positive example of the loss directly sure. attributed to the Niagara Pensa Conservation Authority? Sure, through you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, um, the, wh what I mentioned was since uh, pre-settlement times, 94% uh, of the upland forests uh, in, this, in the Carolinian zone have been lost. I mentioned Niagara had uh, some of the most significant stands left of that forest. And the Conservation Authority is the, uh, is the agency responsible for protecting uh, forest uh, cover, forest loss, and, uh, and for protecting provincially significant wetlands. <laughs> and I just noted these photos uh, which uh, show continued loss in spite of policies which should be uh, uh, providing uh, the contrary. So just so I'm clear, so the Niagara Peninsula Conservation Authority isn't responsible for any of those photos you've shown. Those are just examples of... Areas that were forests but are no longer forests. Right. Or areas where there were species at risk and... and, and sure. Yeah. But nothing tagged on to that. Niagara Peninsula Conservation Authority as directly contributing to that loss. Well, their their mandate is to protect those uh, features. Uh, they're the only they're the only agency or authority to do that. The region doesn't do that. Municipalities don't do that. Right. Uh, the uh, the sole responsibility for that in planning in Ontario is is with the conservation authorities here where we have them. The Minister of Natural Resources does as well in other areas, but uh, that's their sole responsibility. Uh, so these losses are alarming because the policies are intended to prevent, to, sure. to create, to do the opposite. And so they've directly caused those losses, is what you're saying? No, I didn't say that. I mentioned that they're there to protect uh, um, forests and significant forests and provincially significant wetlands, and uh, um, the policies that they're uh, given uh, by the province and uh, the, the duties that they're given. Uh, are, are there to try to protect those areas and to ensure that we have uh, representation of uh, those significant florists uh, in the Carol in this uh, southern part of Canada, for instance, or provincially significant wetlands. Uh, so their job is to uh, protect those areas and uh, right. policies they have. They have the tools and the uh, policies and regulations and the mandate to do that. And uh, I'm, I, I highlight these because these are alarming examples of the opposite. But for, we don't know who, who uh, is responsible for that. We right. know that the okay. conservation authority is responsible to ensure that this doesn't happen. Right. Okay. Any further questions Thank you. from my left? Ms. Ms. Butters, uh, again? Yes. Uh, just to Councillor Bodner's point, um, I think that it, the way I, I'm taking it is that if if something is declared a provincially significant wetland or or uh, forest, and those things are not protected, and those things disappear, which, by the looks of it, there's no trees there, then how did that happen? And if there, if the policies are not being enacted as uh, rigorously as they should, then there's the responsibility lies somewhere. Right? And we have to ask ourselves that question of like, who's responsible then, you know, and whether the NPCA, I'm, nobody's suggesting they went down with a chainsaw and cut all these trees down. But the trees are gone, they were provincially significant, so why, why weren't they protected in the first place? 
And this that, would be the question point. is to Mr. Rodner. Is that well, correct? it's just a That's comment in response to, to that. Oh. Thank you. So it wasn't a question, it was a comment. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, gentlemen. I very much appreciate your being here and providing this thank information. You. Our next, Mr. Demers, do you have a question? <clears throat> I do, Mr. Mayor, thank you. Um, this is actually through you to Mr. Louie. Um, I've asked Scott earlier this evening to explain why um, you would not be declaring a conflict of interest this evening. Just for, for the information so that it's out there and it's understood what that process is. Mr. Louie, if you would, Scott. Sure. Through your worship to Councillor Demaray. Um, I don't know where to start. I guess I, I'll start by saying I'm not a lawyer, so I can't give legal advice or a legal opinion to council or to the mayor about a conflict of interest. It's important to know some of the practical rules about conflict of interest, though. One of them is that it's the member's duty, responsibility, to determine if him, he or she has a conflict. It's not up to a member of the public or another member of council to point at the member and say, I think you have a conflict. Member has to self-declare. Having said that, uh, the Conflict of Interest Act, it really speaks to, it only speaks to a financial gain or loss, not always a gain, it could be a loss, uh, that a member may have when deciding on, a, uh, on an issue that's before council. You, you have to declare that you have a pecuniary interest, and if you don't declare that and you still make the decision, then you're found to be in conflict. But the way you're found in conflict is somebody has to take you to court. Nothing can happen at council, Nothing can happen at the region, nothing can happen anywhere. Any person who thinks that you did wrong, that you acted in a conflict, has to take you to court. Having said that, in this particular case, there are uh, exemptions from the Conflict of Interest Act. There's a number of exemptions. For example, a volunteer firefighter who's a council member is allowed to vote on fire issues because um, they're exempted from the act, even though they're paid to be a firefighter, whereas no other, no other municipal employee is allowed to be a council member. And the particular exemption that I would probably direct you to about the mayor's role on, as the head of this council, the chair of this meeting, and a member of the Conservation Authority Board is section four of the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act in Ontario, subsection H, which states by reason only of the member being a director or senior officer of a corporation incorporated for the purpose of carrying on business for and on behalf of the municipality or local board, and this is where it gets important, or by reason only of the member being a member of a board, commission, or other body as an appointee of a council or local board. And I, in my opinion, this applies to the mayor who is a member of the Conservation Authority Board by virtue of appointment of regional council, and it exempts him from having to declare or having a pecuniary interest in anything to do with the Conservation Authority Board. So. Thank, Thank you. you. That, that, that <laughs> I just wanted that information out there so everybody was fully understanding of that. It's uh, Section 4, Subsection 8, and Section 9. Thank you for pointing that out, Mrs. DeMamory. Okay, are we ready to proceed with this? We have uh, the next presentation then. is the Conservation Authority, Mr. Mark Brickle. <coughs> Mr. Todd McDonald, President of uh, Performance Concept. Okay. Well, we have there Mr. Annunziata, the ch Chair of the Conservation Authority. Good evening. And you have 10 minutes, okay. everybody. <clears throat> Is there something I should push here? It's no, on. you're good, okay. it's on. Um, my name is Crystal Caputo. I'm the communication specialist with the MPCA, and I'm also a member of OPSU. I'm here today addressing Council through you, Mayor Maloney, regarding the motion to appoint a supervisor to MPCA. For the past two months, I've been engaging with all the materials that have been put forth to various councils and committees. On one hand, I'm perplexed and disheartened that we're here tonight. On the other, I'm grateful that we're in a position to address the people of the Niagara watershed and their concerns through this council. What I find perplexing is that all the concerns that were publicly paraded would have made sense to bring forward in 2013, which is when the Board of the Day was made aware and began the process of initiating a strategic plan. 
I've spent the last two months reviewing everything from media articles to hazard reports to letters and responding to all the concerns and questions within these documents. There are six independent reports that all confirm the NPCA is a healthy organization. The chair has released no fewer than three statements this year alone, as well as numerous media releases that recognize the efforts and hard work of so many of our partners. The following third party reports have been completed. Grant Thornton, financial audit, green light. We are now engaging KPMG to conduct our audits, the same auditor as the Ministry of Natural Resources. Two, Dillon Consulting, value for money audit, green light. They recommend conducting our restoration programming differently to enhance accountability, which the board has since done. Canada Revenue Agency audits, green light on both HST audit and payroll audit. Performance concepts review of NPC operations from 2014 to 2017. Green light, Mr. McDonald will be addressing you shortly. <laughs> Ministry of Labor, review of any HR complaints. Green light, no complaints. Justice, Ramey, Justice Ramsey confirming Ed Smith's allegations and accusations are inaccurate and deliberately misleading. The amount of work that this organization has... <coughs> I would ask members of the body of this council chambers not to clap, not to make any comments. You're entitled to hear... It's a, not a public forum. It's a meeting open to the public. And I ask you to respect the, those rules, please. I just believe she needs the transcript. Pardon me? I just believe she needs the transcript. Thank you. I won't engage you on that point, sir. Again, any further interjections? Individuals who are interjecting would ask me to leave the council chamber. Go ahead, Ms. Cahuto. Thank you. The amount of work that this organization has undertaken and completed despite challenging circumstances is amazing, particularly under the ridiculous amount of media scrutiny focused on us. As an example, this weekend alone, there were four articles on the homepage of the St. Catherine Standard. The legislative mandate of the Conservation Authorities as set out in Section 20 of the Conservation Authorities Act is to establish and undertake programs designed to further the conservation, restoration, development, and management of natural resources. That's what the team works tirelessly towards every day at MPCA. I mentioned being disheartened. It's because this organization has been so grossly misreported on that staff are being affected. That's unfair and it's unacceptable. They just want to do their jobs and go home to their families. And if I may, every single staff member I've interacted with has not only been kind and welcoming, but has patiently and passionately engaged me in their work. These people are doing good, important work, and it isn't right they're that they're being penalized. CAO Brickle has brought forward bold initiatives that are fully supported by our board, because they too know that the NPCA is poised to deliver on them. Port Colborne Council has previously, through a motion, asked for an audit to be conducted by the Auditor General. The AG is now beginning the audit process. We have welcomed the Auditor General numerous times stated that we're excited to welcome her and offer her unfettered access to anything she needs to complete her audit. If the evidence is not enough to convince you as logical people, I would like to point out that the province does not actually have the author legislative authority to appoint a supervisor. All motions to allow the province legislative ability to appoint a supervisor lost at the committee level, third reading. Neither the City of Port Colborne nor any local municipality has the ability to start the dissolution process of the MPCA. I applied for this position because I knew that the MPCA needed help sharing with the public the reality of what MPCA is doing. I realize I do not know many of you personally and I look forward to that changing soon. But those of you who do know me know that I hold integrity as a core personal tenant and I would not be here if I did not wholeheartedly believe that the MPCA is an organization with integrity. It would be my hope that you, our elected officials, will take the time to make the right decision. If you make the, right, if you make the time to familiarize yourselves, I'm confident that you will come to the logical conclusion that a supervisor is, at MPCA is not necessary. What is the decision to request the appointment of a win appointed supervisor even based on? What is the request to dissolve the MPCA based on? I'd now like to introduce Todd McDonald of Performance Concepts so that he may speak to third-party evidence-based operational review of the MPCA. Mr. Mayor, Council, I'll be uh, as quick as I can. I realize we're under a rigorous time uh, constraint. Performance Concepts Consulting, uh, I'm the president of the firm. We've been in business since 2000. We've conducted over 200 evidence-based operational reviews for Canadian municipalities, uh, a number here in Niagara. And I was retained in Q2 
of 2017 to conduct uh, a third party evaluation of the progress that the NPCA has made under its change mandate, uh, under its strategic plan. Uh, let's remember that in 2012 and 2013, this was a very different organization. Uh, the wide-ranging consultation at the beginning of the strategic plan set out the kinds of problems that you see in the slide before you. I can't help but have a little bit of deja vu this evening. I was part of that process, and many of the comments that I've heard previously sound like comments that could have been directed to that organization, but uh, on the basis of my findings don't appear relevant in 2017. I will mention that the work that I have done is not a friendly audit. Uh, uh, neither the board nor the CAO have directed me in any way around conducting my review and my conclusions are the evidence-based conclusions of my firm. Uh, we uh, have reviewed, I tried to count today, I got close to 200 independent documents, uh, park master plans, policies, staff reports, budgets, audited financial statements. We conducted six stakeholder working sessions with uh, a wide range of NPCA stakeholders conducted staff interviews, uh, all as the underpinnings of uh, my team's work. The key to the strategic plan, of course, is that this has been the change agent driven uh, process to transform the organization. The NPCA in 2017 uh, bears faint resemblance to the organization that I began working with in 2012. And the evaluation of the current strategic plan is gonna position them well for the upcoming 2018 strategic plan. So the key question that I was retained to answer was, has the 2014 change plan actually worked? Have the fundamental challenges that were identified in the plan and the problems that the organization was facing, have they been addressed and resolved moving forward? In order to do that, as I mentioned, wide-ranging stakeholder uh, consultations and uh, a value for money review of their internal technical processes and controls. Uh, so you can see here the evaluation hit on all of these issues, governance and accountability, asset management, the development permitting system. I can actually answer questions on who, uh, on who actually validates development decisions to clear land. Uh, stakeholder and public consultation, uh, policy-driven decision-making, a whole series of these criteria were used in my review. A series of these progress maps that you see on the uh, screen in front of you were developed. Uh, this is for the Governance and Accountability Progress Map. Uh, this is an organization, every one of their meetings is on TV. Excuse me, Mr. McDonald, I don't mean to interrupt, but you've got two minutes for the whole presentation, so. I better, uh, I better make some strategic decisions here about what I want to talk about then. These progress maps that you see are dealing with all of the key operational performance issues at the NPCA. <clears throat> uh, marked progress on a wide variety of fronts, you can see here. <clears throat> The, uh, they've reversed some of their revenue expenditure uh, deficits and turned them into surpluses. They have self-generated funds. Uh, this is a healthy organization with a healthy balance sheet and healthy financial control systems. Uh, the development approvals process has been streamlined. These people are using workflow software to generate, as a regulator, timely permitting decisions and timely advice to the region and the local municipalities on development decisions. Uh, they are able to produce uh, detailed evidence on the uh, amount of time required to turn around processes. This feels like a competent organization with the kinds of well-functioning systems that I'm happy to see with my municipal clients. Overall, uh, through the course of my review, hundreds of documents, uh, hours and hours of stakeholder and uh, client uh, interviews, uh, eventually, it came down to this kind of an evaluation framework. This is not a perfect organization. There are none. None of my municipal clients are perfect. But this is an organization that has turned the corner on uh, a weak uh, foundation in 2012. They've used the, their strat plan as a change, progress-driven tool, uh, B-plus type of results on governance and accountability, A-level on financial controls, asset management, and uh, healthy budget systems. Uh, a B-plus level of performance in the, uh, in the functioning of their permitting and development approvals processes, working closely with the region. A B-level of uh, Mr. McDonald, can achievement. can I ask you to wind up your presentation, yep. please? 30 seconds. 30, well, 
Okay, but the I'm only making one presentation, Mr. Mayor. Had will allow you 30 I promise. Seconds. One, one presentation here. Um, there are improvement opportunities. I've outlined what some of those are uh, around central purchasing, around using key performance indicators to build an environmental scorecard, continuing to use the Community and Liaison Advisory Committee, which is now an, uh, a mechanism that's actually been embedded in the new Conservation Act, best practice from Niagara, and continuing with targeted program reviews that are improving value for money. This plan has moved this, in, this organization into the category that I would describe as being competently managed. Uh, the strategic planning cycle can build on that coming up. There have already been uh, a range of announcements about the now uh, stable and competent organization moving forward with ambitious new environmental programming. And overall, uh, this is uh, an organization whose previous management deficiencies have been dealt with. Uh, and, Thank you, Mr. Uh, McDonald. Uh, we Happy to rush. Interruption time. No worries. Uh, Happy to answer questions. Questions of Council. Ms. Butters. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you to Mr. McDonald, thank you for coming. Um, when you were doing your evaluation and the uh, work that you did for the MPCA, did you also evaluate in the Human Resources Department their hiring and firing practices? Through you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Uh, HR processes that, quite frankly, in 2012 and 23 were arbitrary and non-existent uh, have been professionalized. Uh, there are HR specialists in the organization. Job descriptions have been modernized and updated. Uh, 360-based evaluation processes between management and staff are being implemented. There are new HRIS information systems that have been put in place. Uh, the evolving HR infrastructure to me feels like uh, a significant improvement and headed well towards what I would describe as municipal industry best practices. Thank you. And <coughs> could I continue, Butters? please? Thank you. Um, so did you also examine or do an evaluation of land purchase and disposal um, of lands um, policies surrounding that? Yes. Uh, Mr. Mr. Mayor, through you again. Uh, the, uh, the NPCA has implemented a series of land management criteria, which they call the six plus one criteria, the plus one being environmental value. Uh, they have used those criteria to conduct a detailed overhaul of their land holdings, uh, maintenance agreements that they were involved in with low value environmental properties were eliminated. Uh, dollars were funneled into the purchase of higher uh, value conservation properties at Balls Falls and in Waynefleet. And a series of uh, problematic purchases uh, were, uh, were refused on the basis of using those objective criteria. Those criteria came from a working group of notable Niagarans that were developed during the strategic planning process. Thank you. And, and so you, um, so that was your company that um, helped that happen. Is that yes or no? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, the six plus one land management criteria were developed by a working group of notable Niagarans during the strategic planning process. Uh, those criteria were then brought forward to the board and endorsed by the board and uh, staff's land management activities have been executed against those criteria since that time. Okay. And may I continue? Go ahead. Uh, and the, and the uh, part of the consultation that, you did, that was gone through included um, environmental groups and developers and, and farmers and all kinds of people because I did read what you sent us. I, yes. I, went, I went through it all. And I did notice that there was a letter from um, a farmer that was, you know, I would say in a supportive, a supportive letter. But I was wondering how many letters you received um, on all total. And it, did you receive any letters from, like, the environmental groups? Sure. Uh, Mr. Mayor, to, to address, I think, the intent of the question, let me again repeat. We've held six stakeholder working groups with these various stakeholders. We heard a wide variety of opinions, some positive, <coughs> some grudgingly positive, some not positive on legitimate questions of public policy around the NPCA's mandate. Are they an impartial technical regulator or are they in fact an advocate for the environment? Those differences on legitimate aspects of public policy were heard and noted. Uh, when it came to the questions though of uh, feedback, uh, the reason that that letter was included was because it was one of the relatively few stakeholder organizations that were able to consult and draft an official position. Uh, moving forward. It, it's fair to say there was a wide variation of feedback that I received in those stakeholder sessions. 
Okay, and um, I'm glad you mentioned um, public policy um, through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so <clears throat> what kind of public policy um, encourages the hiring of board members, either as employees or consultants? What part of public policy are, are you relying on or does anybody rely on to hire board members to positions as employees or as consultants? Yeah. Um, I'm not going to get into the particulars of uh, uh, purchasing decisions that the board has made. The board has a purchasing bylaw. The annual audits that are performed uh, haven't uh, come up with any uh, discrepancies in that regard. Uh, the CAO, I know, is committed to implementing uh, a revamped centralized purchasing model with a purchasing officer uh, on staff to lend uh, additional discipline and efficiencies to the purchasing process. This is an organization that buys a lot of things from a lot of people, and uh, that level of centralization was supported in my report. I didn't Mrs. hear Butters. an answer to that question, sir. Uh, do you have actual numbers, sir? I, I didn't hear an answer to that question, but maybe that's a question that Mr. Um, Annunziata needs to answer. I don't know. I'm just very simple. <coughs> public policy, where in public policy does anybody figure it's a good idea to hire board members into positions in an organization like the MPCA, which we know happened. We know that happened. And, and if you don't if you don't want to answer the question, that's okay. That's Mr. not Anunziata, even your problem. Do you feel comfortable answering that? Question? I'm I'm actually happy within the context of my report to note that, uh, or within in, within my practice for hundreds of municipalities that I've seen many examples of former municipal staff that run for elected office. I've seen many examples of uh, elected holders of office who have withdrawn from that position and taken on positions as staff members. Uh, it's not, uh, uh, I would hesitate to call it common, but it's certainly uh, not unprecedented and not necessarily unusual. Mr. Anunziata, you seem eager to add to that. Um, well, I appreciate the question, but I don't know what help I would be. A lot of the issues that you raise, and I'm assuming go back to 2012, 2013, it predates my time on the board and certainly my time as a an elected official, so uh, I'm sorry I can't lend uh, a more thorough answer to that question. Sure, sure. It does predate me. Go ahead, Mr. Butler. Unless, unless, unless you want to be specific, I mean, it's, I know it's a broad question you're asking, but if you well, want to I don't think that a, it's any specific. Okay, it's I don't think it's any secret that um, Carmen D'Angelo was on the board. Um, smart <laughs> guy, lots to offer. So this is you know this is about that that individual. We also have a regional councillor here who was on the board, and both of those individuals ended up, you know, one is a CAO, and another, um, in the case of Mr. Barrick, a, a different position within the MPCA. And so I'm just, that's my question. In terms of public policy, the personalities aside, their qualifications aside, because I'm not, you know, I'm not interested in throwing any of, either of those guys under the bus, believe me. I think they're very competent, type individuals and do do the job that they do. Got no beef with that. My problem with it is, and was when it happened, that it looks, it doesn't look good when that happens, sir. It just does not look good. And so I'm just asking if that's... that's um, you said something we, we, we both agree upon and both those individuals are extremely competent and they do an excellent job in their respective roles. Uh, again, with respect to policy and crafting public policy back in 2012, 2013. Uh, I'm not privy to those decisions and certainly they predate my time and quite frankly the majority of the board members they, they predate. Uh, if Mr. McDonald wants to speak specifically to uh, overall policy and your specific questions, uh, I'll turn the floor over to him. But again, predates my time on the board. I, I think rather than categorizing that as a question of public policy, I would categorize it as a question of management practice. And uh, again, I would reflect on my travels across hundreds of assignments. I've uh, come across number, a number of uh, well-managed municipalities uh, where members of staff have decided to uh, devote themselves to elected office and vice versa. There's nothing inherently unusual in that practice. 
Uh, as far as the question of optics goes, I really can't, cons I don't have a comment on that. I'm an evidence-based professional, and I've conducted a wide-ranging view of this organization based on evidence, hundreds of documents, thousands of numbers, policies, and uh, many hours with people. Maybe I can zero in a little bit. When either or both of those two individuals were hired by the Niagara Parks Committee, or not, NPCA, were they acting and active board members at that time, or were they not? Uh, in both cases, they took leaves uh, from the board. Um, I, I think, the, like, the question's a great question, and because I, I do want to take a, a, a shot at this one a little bit. Um, I don't think that's the perfect situation. I think what you had was a very broken conservation authority back in 2012. And I can tell you, respectfully, I can tell you that when I arrived at the organization in 2014, they didn't have basic HR functions. They didn't have meaningful budgets. They didn't have long-term capital planning. They didn't have proper business and management systems in place. I think the board of the day probably made a decision that they had to make some, bring about some important changes to just bring this corporation to a level of competency so that it can do the important work that it's meant to do. So I, I respect that, the comment you're making and the suggestion you're making. I don't think it's ideal that that ever happens. Uh, but I do think that these were unique times that required uh, unique actions and that perhaps uh, some, uh, some special circumstances existed. We can't go back in time. I wasn't there. I don't know exactly what it was, but when I look at it in hindsight, I look at it to say I do know that the uh, NPCA that existed back in 2012 was a very low-performing conservation authority, and we are working every day to restore that. Thank you, Mr. Burko. Mrs. Rogers, are you? I'll, I'll have some closing comments, but okay. any other people should speak. To my right, does Mrs. Kenny. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, through you, I just have <coughs> really one question. That's of uh, Sandy and Angiato. Hi, Ben. Hi, Sandy. You're an Argo fan, right? Yeah. <laughs> good. I, uh, I um, am reading, a, I guess, a document that is a conference call yes. um, from the Auditor General's office that took place in January. It says January the 24th this year at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. And at that time, you were speaking to a Bonnie Lisk. I think that's how you say your name. Bonnie Lysak. From Bonnie the, uh, yeah. <coughs> so I just want to ask you one question, because I think in that 30, min 30 minutes, I think, it says here it started at 3, and I believe at the very end it says it finished at 3.30. So in, uh, for half an hour, you just chatted back and forth. Um, and several times you said in there that you could not make a unilateral decision in regards to having the Auditor General come in and take. You said that at least three, at least three, maybe four times in that four-page document. So, anyways, and, and I get that because you're just the chair. Correct. Well, what I want to know is why you, as the chair, would have not brought this back to the board in February at your February meeting and said, "You know what? I've had this chat, and I want to make a recommendation to the board that we proceed." Because you seem to have a pretty good conversation with her back and forth. Uh, uh, and that, just, just yep. that and answer that question for me. Thanks. And, and through uh, your worship <laughs> to uh, the counselor, it's a, it's a great question. I've had many conversations with uh, Ms. Lysak, uh, her team, and uh, we've cooperated to the full extent with whatever her office requires. Uh, part of those conversations have certainly included finding a path forward, um, understanding that conservation authorities do not fall under the purview of the Auditor General. Uh, there are opportunities where the Auditor General can involve herself in a conservation authority and certainly uh, a municipality. And those two paths forward uh, require uh, the explicit consent of the Minister or uh, an order through the Standing Committee on Public Accounts. Uh, we've already ex we've always expressed that desire to find the path forward and the majority of my conversation with my, Ms. Ms. Lysak actually explicitly put out that directive. Let's find a way forward for you to do this. Um, at the time, uh, back in January, and I subscribe to an old saying that you don't look in the past because that's not the direction you're moving towards. Uh, I do know that the board uh, unanimously approved the involvement of the Auditor General. 
uh, and I believe that was in um, May or June, uh, we passed that directive on to Ms. Lysak and her team, um, and we went about, over the course of the next five months, trying to find a path forward. Grateful that the Standing Committee on Public Accounts gave her uh, the permission and the authority to move forward with an audit and we couldn't be happier and we've opened up our offices and we will avail our services and everything she needs to conduct a very robust um, uh, audit of the Conservation Authority. Contrary to the, um, the comments that this is not a friendly audit, uh, I have the incredible respect and the utmost respect for the Auditor General of Ontario. She does incredible work on behalf of our residents and I have no doubt that she will be thorough, uh, she will be impartial, and she will conduct herself with the utmost integrity. And so any suggestion that... The other, I think you've yeah. answered the question. And, and any suggestion that she won't, um, I, I, I don't agree with that. Councilor Kenny? So you're telling me she's not going to be friendly when she comes? I hope she's not friendly. <laughs> uh, I hope she, she can uh, I, I just bring in her team and absolutely. Yeah, but, but I will say this, it, so specific to, to the question, through your worship, at the time we were working with a motion mm -hmm. already, uh, and the motion was counter to um, any direction that would involve the Auditor General. Uh, so we were already working in good faith with a motion, uh, and I think I alluded to that many, many times in that conversation. So, yeah, Audit Councilor yeah. Kenning, can you... Uh, I Mr. Mayor, questions? I just want to know when is it going to happen? It's going to happen, and like uh, we're excited I, to bring Tell me the date. A date. Not when, yeah, it's uh, going to happen. Uh, I want a date. <laughs> um, I, I can't... Obviously, the Auditor General does incredible work, and she's been busy with a whole bunch of other files, but as soon as she can uh, come down and, uh, um, and engage uh, our audit committee and certainly the board, uh, we're going to get started. We've made the commitment to expedite the process and get it as quickly as possible. It's but again, year. I can't speak for her. Uh, I can speak for the NPCA and say we want it done as quickly as possible. Yeah. So now is no good. You can't say I want it now because she I says she's available. I want, want it now. now. <laughs> I want it right now. Okay. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. Any further questions to my right? Oh. Councilor Demery. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you. Um, to whoever would like to answer. I would just like to speak for a few minutes about public dollars. Um, sure. It's very important to me that we watch public dollars very closely and that we disclose everything that we do with them. So um, we heard a comment about uh, healthy financial control systems in place and I would just like to further that a little bit and just uh, have some understanding of procurement policies and of any changes that have taken place as a result of some of the troubles that you've had. What policy changes have you made okay. to this point? So through your worship, I'm going to refer that question to Mr. McDonald, but um, if with, for, for the benefit of everyone's information, <coughs> we have prepared a handout, and if your worship would indulge me, then we can pass that to the clerk, mm -hmm. and the clerk can distribute it to council, if, if that's okay. But to Mr. McDonald's question. Okay. And for you, Mr. Mayor, I want to assure you, I am not embarking on another presentation. I just want to put this up here quickly to make a couple of quick comments around financial controls. I'll never forget the meeting that I came into in 2012 during the strategic planning process. There was a budget variance meeting going on and uh, I'm a municipal career professional and it was incomprehensible to me. There was no capital budget, there was no operating budget, there was just one large long together budget. It wasn't clear that the organization chart reflected the way that the accounting was done. It wasn't clear that the budget reflected either the organization chart or the way that the accounting was done. It was a mess. In 2014 and in 2015, the NPCA finally secured uh, some expert financial management uh, staff. Uh, systems were put in place. Uh, I can assure you now that the, uh, that the org structure is the basis for the accounting that in turn supports the budget, that the program areas are clearly identified and costed, uh, that the dollar values in the capital budget are well understood. There's a 20-year capital plan. There's an asset management plan. All the assets have been cataloged and inventoried. Condition ratings applied to them. The cycle of reinvestment in those assets are reflected in the budget. This conservation authority is as well managed financially as any of the over 200 municipalities that I have conducted operational reviews around. Okay, so I, I don't... Um, I don't feel that my question was answered there. Um, I asked what changes you've made. I, I would like you to cite the policy changes, please. The changes that have been made? Yes. Uh, there was no capital budget. Now there is one. 
There was no capital forecast. Now there's a 20-year capital forecast. So these there are policy was... changes? Well, these are management system changes. Yes. These are management system management changes. Management system changes, okay. Uh, those systems are now in place uh, that were not in place uh, before. This was an organization whose parks ran at large deficits. Your local tax dollars are now supporting parks that run on user fee driven surpluses. This is an organization that has become financially sustainable. Okay. Uh, when we talk about a provincial supervisor, uh, in the past, in healthcare or in education, there have been provincial supervisors where large flows of provincial money were involved. There are no large flows of provincial money involved in the operation of the NPCA. Uh, this organization is self-funded by its local <coughs> levy uh, partners through the conservation levy and through a combination of user fees. If for the most part, those are the primary sources of funding for the organization. Okay, and so when I look at healthy financial pictures, I look at policy changes that should have been made or, or could still be made. Um, but in any case, there should be policy statements around things like procurement policies. Yes. Um, and I, I want to know, have changes been made to your procurement policy since... since my report, uh, Mr. I know Mr. Brickle will comment in detail here in just one second, but my report did note that a new centralized purchasing model uh, is being brought into place. As I mentioned, this is an organization that uh, purchases a wide variety of input materials and human services from a wide variety of vendors. And it was my view, and Mr. Brickles, I know that centralization of those processes should occur and uh, the level of management oversight pulling this together in a diverse organization would be appropriate. Do you want to comment beyond that? Just a couple of things, perhaps <laughs> not, rather concisely, if you can, or in an easily understood form. Go ahead, Mr. Berkeley. Well, the simplest example would be that certainly there is a, a much better purchasing policy in place, procurement policy in place. It identifies very clear thresholds and very clear authorities. So we know who has to sign off on every single dollar amount when it has to go to the board, when it requires CAO approval, when it can be purchased at the front, uh, front level. That's a good example okay. of one of those things. And thank you. And, and I, I would ask, um, what about ethical purchasing? Is it, is it ethical for the NPCA to spend public dollars purchasing printed material from an employee's company? Uh, that would be inappropriate and that does not happen. I want to give you that assurance. Well, and okay. It, it, it would does be not happen? It does not happen. So Printing Owl is not a company that you would use to print, to, to have printing done? Uh, no. No. Okay, um, that's interesting. I, I have in front of me um, a, a, a packing of, a packing label, and, yeah, no, and I know, it's I kind understand. of an interesting thing, you know. I understand that a lot of there's a lot of confusing information out there. No, I, I do understand. No, black I, and white isn't confusing to me. Yeah. Um, it's, it's here. But I have I, looked. I, I know this specific example. You're welcome you're to having of. it. You know. I've actually responded to the person who requested that information. And uh, I was able to look into that specific matter and confirm that no, there was no purchase made through that company. Well, it's a very interesting thing because it's, uh, I'm, I, it's near and dear to me because this is right behind my house. Yeah. So, and there's not a company there. I can assure so you. So it's kind of an interesting I thing. I checked specifically with finance and our finance people have confirmed that there was no purchase of, of printing materials from that company. So are, are you saying that this, this was um, a fabricated label? No, I, no. I don't understand. No, it's, it's the label that's used by the individual who is ordering uh, these materials. Um, and, and unfortunately, uh, it goes through his private account, but however, there, was no, uh, there were no charges to that company. I have verified okay. that. So Niagara Peninsula Conservation Authority did not cut a check to Printing Owl? Um, according to our finance people, which I checked with today, that's true. Okay. So any audit will show that in, in the end, anyway, sure. correct? All right. That's fine. Thank we, you. That's, we that's the, the kind of thing that I want to know yeah, because okay. there's yeah. a lot of confusion Questions around this. Questions and answers. Sure. Yeah. So, okay. Um, further to that, and we talk about, you know, changes in policy, certainly changes on in the way business is conducted. Mm -hmm. I would ask that uh, the, the point has been taken already about the more than one per diem um, in, a, in a given day, in a calendar day. I would hope that there may have been some changes to that. Has there been a change? I'll let the chair address that one. Well, and I appreciate the question. Um, our expense policy uh, 
is, I, I think you have a copy of it. Um, with respect to some of the misinformation that's being put forward, <coughs> there are times when there's been four or five or six meetings uh, that I've attended. Mm -hmm. um, and because of my schedule, certainly our executive coordinator makes sure that they position themselves either back to back at the same location mm -hmm. at our Welland office. And you can see uh, there have been times when there's three, four, five, or six meetings uh, taken up the majority of my day, and there's only one per diem claim. There are other instances, and I think uh, through the expense sheets, there's either four or five of those referenced expenses where there's maybe two meetings or maybe there's three meetings. But I can assure you the circumstances are entirely different. Um, one meeting might be at 9 a.m. and go to about 10.30. Uh, then a quick home to take the kids to the dentist and possibly uh, dinner with the family and then off to Port Coburn City Council. Um, technically that is eligible for two per diem expenses. So again, there are circumstances that arise when meetings are not back to back. Uh, they're in different locations throughout the region. And I think every one of those expenses that have been referenced, you can see that one is in Niagara Falls, the next one is five hours later in West Lincoln, the next one after that is maybe two hours later at a municipal council uh, in Niagara Lake or Lincoln. So it does happen from time to time. Uh, they are appropriate under our expense policy. And um, again, I think the appropriate forum, if there's a concern, certainly bring that forward. We're all about strengthening our policies. We're all about listening to the concerns of our uh, partners. So but, uh, uh, Mr. Hunt, yeah, that would be something yeah. that the Auditor General would pick up when she uh, does her audit. Uh, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. She'll have, she, she'll have all that information again. But again, to clarify, to make the blanket statement that for somehow board members are charging two or three or four pro diems, Mm -hmm. That's not uh, that's not entirely the full story. Again, I, try, I I hope I explained to you that there are circumstances where there's back to back to back to back meetings, and yeah. technically that's one that's one per diem. At least that's the decision I make and the choice I make. There are times when there's lags between those meetings: two mm -hmm. hours, three hours, four hours, even five hours, and they're in different parts of the region. Again, through okay. the, our okay. executive okay. coordinator. Okay. Yes, Mrs. Uh, Demery. Yes, I still have you, some more. Thank you. You, you can bring these points up or submit oh, them I, to the I will. general. I definitely I will. Her to look uh, into those. Without a doubt. Okay, but I do have uh, I do have another point or two to, to cover. Um, another now, um, we look at disclosing the use of public dollars. Absolutely. Several public dollars were obviously used in a recent lawsuit, mm -hmm. um, and legal fees across the board have, have been spent. Um, it's been a choice to um, use a client, uh, a lawyer client privilege to get away from s disclosing those dollars. I don't think that's correct, and I would really like to see somebody step up tonight and disclose <coughs> those dollars. What was spent? I'll, I'll take that as a comment then. I, 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 the regulations uh, are, are pretty clear with respect to solicitor client privilege, and we respect those. Regulations? Um, under the Freedom of Information Act. They're pretty clear as far as what constitutes um, solicitor client privilege and what can be uh, released through FOI and what can't be FOI. And we make sure that we follow those regulations and those rules very, very appropriately. So what you're saying is the Freedom of Information Act actually restricts you from disclosing the use of public dollars for legal fees? I the number of dollars. I don't spent. think I said that. I well, said the release of those information, the release of that information, uh, is captured within um, within the Freedom of Information Act. There are some things that we can disclose, and certainly there are other things that fall under the uh, guidance of solicitor client privilege that we cannot disclose. Yeah, well, it's just my understanding that um, if they're public dollars, they have to be reported somewhere, and I would expect that they be reported. That's all. That's all I have. Another point that could be followed up uh, I will. with response yes. uh, from the Auditor General. Definitely. So you'll Thank get you. your answer. That's eventually. everything for now, but I will have some closing comments. Well, we can't go on forever, ladies. I won't. I have <laughs> just I'm a page. I'm going to give my friends to my left here an opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Elliott, Mr. Doucette, and Mr. Bodner. Go ahead, Mr. Elliott, first. Thank you, Mayor. I, I've been sitting listening to, to both sides, and I must say, I. I've lived in Niagara my whole life, and I have never seen nor heard 
a more polarizing issue than this, ever, in all of Niagara, ever. And I listened to your communication specialist come up and say, man, everything's rosy at the NPCA. And I listened to your consultant say, everything operates with B's and A's, and it's a great operation. And yet, the people that pay the freight and elect you have stood up, and Mr. Smith has been a lightning rod, have stood up and said, we don't like what you're doing. And I haven't heard one word from you or your organization that has said to these people, we hear what you're saying. We would like to invite you in and have a look and listen to you. Everything from the NPCA has been pushback. Pushback. You're wrong. That's not what we said. That's not how we operate. That's not what we do. Do you even hear what hundreds of people across, and it, it may even be thousands of people, across the region are telling you and are asking you, we don't like the way you operate. We don't like the things that we see. And yet, you don't acknowledge that. The frustration level answers some of the questions. It went to court, right? The judge rules that you're a government agency, so you can't sue people. That's fine. But there's still no answers to the questions. What Mr. Smith put up on his issues with you, I don't think have ever been answered. We translate into how the NPCA operates so smoothly and efficiently. And there's, there's practices that have put in, been put into place from 2012 till now. But you still don't answer the questions that the public has. And really, there's not a forum for the public to get answers or do anything. Because basically, you say we don't answer to anybody. We don't answer to the provincial government. We don't answer to anybody from the public. We can't have a supervisor come into place because the government won't allow that or do that. So what I'm saying is the frustration level for people is you're not giving us any answers to the questions we have. And I'd like for you to say right now in front of these people, we're going to listen to what you have to say. We're going to answer your questions. And somehow we're going to get to the end of this. So I'd like to hear how you respond <coughs> directly to these people sitting in front of you right now. Thank you for your comments. Does anyone wish to respond to that? Uh, uh, I, 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 can I actually, I say, can I actually speak to that? Sorry, if that, there was no question there, but I am the communication specialist, and I think this speaks exactly to what you're suggesting. But uh, just, just a quick point. I, I will say, though, that we did get a C in communication. <laughs> so we, we recognize that. Um, and we have to do a better job of telling people what it is that we do. OK, uh, can we respond to the question? Um, so part of the work that I've been doing, besides responding to all of these Hansard reports and letters and accusations that we've had thrown at us, is how do we build out that new dialogue with the people, which is part of the initiatives that CAO Brickle moved forward. So I assure you, we don't want this to happen. We want to be open with you. We want to hear you. We're in the process of building out a new uh, web interface so that you can directly submit your, your comments there. We need everyone's help in the watershed to move forward with the initiatives that CAO Brickle has done. Everyone. So we want that dialogue to be open. We're committed to hearing you. I think the confusion might be, sorry, through, through you, Mayor Maloney, um, around the fact that the original source of this document that I'm, I'm not really sure how much I'm allowed to get into, but I, I guess it's there. I have not actually seen it. Um, has really been full. It was informed by bad information, which I think you'll see in the documents that we handed out to you. So to, to answer that, what would make us responding to that document point by point? Like, I, I guess... Like, I'm just trying to be open here and see what you think that we should be doing. Because I, I look at our reports, we've got six independent reviews. Like, I'm from the inside, you say, I see everything's amazing there. First of all, it's, it is a wonderful place to work. But second of all, like, I, I, I'm look, I want to bridge that gap. I mean, you're laughing, but we're openly offering to bridge the gap. So. 
Well, I, I, you have a response to your question. That's right. And, and, I, and I appreciate the response. <laughs> to the chair, yes. to say that, you know, communications you got to see it and you have to communicate to people what you do. I don't think it's a matter of the people not understanding what you do, but how you do it. And there's a big difference between what you do and how you do it. And those are the questions. To say that a lot of this has been based on a document with wrong information or disinformation, really, you can argue both sides of the, of the equation. But they are questions that a gentleman had specifically to be answered. And to this day, I don't know if you've even ever answered his questions directly and dispelled to him or to anybody publicly what's wrong with the questions and what you're going to do about it. Can, can you answer that? If, if you have a question specifically that I that myself or the board or the conservation authority specifically have not answered. You keep referencing that we haven't answered any questions. Can you give me one example? Well, I, I, I think there's... Mr. Smith had a list of questions that he wanted answered. Can, can you give me an example? Well, you know what? If, if he wants to come back and put up his I, list... I would be happy to. I mean, we could get into a question and answer session right here. Well, and I, and I, and I appreciate I, And I know, and I know. We're not, okay. we're not going to. Uh, but to I, me, that, seems to, be the, that seems to be the underlying problem. You, you're here I'm with here your to, group. I'm here to do the best that I can right. to answer your questions right. in a very open and transparent manner. Right. I'm, I'm here at the podium willing to do that. And I haven't really heard a question come forward other than... Well, my, my, biggest, my biggest complaint, my biggest issue is this whole issue and this whole night... Mm -hmm with both sides here seem to be on the communications and you're not hearing what they're saying. We hear loud and clear and I think um, Ms. Caputo encapsulated exactly uh, what we want to do and so, moving forward the dialogue that we want to have with our stakeholders. And here's our here's, here's a, a question then. What can the MPCA do to fully answer questions and put this issue to rest. Mm -hmm. All we can do is answer the questions to the best of our ability. Obviously, we are uh, creatures of legislation. We follow the Conservation Authorities Act. Um, we subscribe to different legislative instruments. Uh, so again, openness and transparency, uh, even <coughs> in your uh, elected capacity, you understand there are things that you can and cannot say and there are things that you can and cannot do with respect to your office. The Conservation Authority is no different, sir. We open uh, our, um, our ourselves up to incredible criticism because there's always individuals that may not like the answers we provide or the work or the scope in which we provide it. All we can do is try to be as open and transparent as possible understanding that there are multiple stakeholders uh, and we have to balance all their needs, whether it's the agricultural community, whether it's the conservation community, whether it's the environmental community, whether it's municipal councils. Um, there are many stakeholders that always take exception to some of the decisions that the conservation authority makes because they don't specifically address or adhere to their specific agenda. It is a balancing act. Um, it's not unusual. Um, I come from Conservation Ontario meetings quite often and I talk to my colleagues. All 36 conservation authorities all across this province, all across Ontario face the same challenges with respect to, um, you know, uh, dissension and uh, people not necessarily agreeing with the direction or the policies that they have in place. But again, we respect the Conservation Authorities Act and we follow that mandate specifically. Thank you, Mr. Nanzia. Mr. Duseth. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Um, first of all, uh, one of the the young lady that started the whole thing there. Crystal, uh, yes, Caputo. Yeah, I couldn't remember the name. Mentioned the fact that some of the staff are being punished with some of this reactionary stuff that's going on. That's a concern of mine, number one. Thank you. But number two... Why are staff being punished over something that we are questioning the board? 
So why is staff being punished out of this? Um, I, 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 I don't understand the, the, the correlation. Mrs. Cabrillo, can you respond? Can you answer? Can you respond to that? Uh, I think uh, my my the tone of that was in the same vein of what happened to me when I spoke here this evening, and I've never met these people, and they took a harsh tone with me, and um, I feel like that's people. I know stories. They're at Tim Hortons, and they have their MPCA jacket on, and they get yelled at. That's not okay. I don't disagree with you, but the 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 the, 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 the through you, Mr. Mayor. The way the comment was made is that staff in general are being punished over people questioning what the board is doing. And that's a concern of mine if that's what's happening. Because that means to me that it isn't necessarily them as much as the board that is coming after oh, no. staff to be able to do something. And I don't know whether that's true or not, but that's the way I interpreted okay. what you said. Then I'm sorry that it didn't come across how I meant it to, because that's not at okay. all what my implication was. Because it, it's it's a definite serious concern of mine. I mean, I don't want staff to be punished for a group of people that are, you know. But I mean, you work here, and there's four articles on the cover of the paper. I mean, you're, it's just, it's, okay. you know. Okay, that, that satisfies me. Um, one more thing, Mr. Mayor. And um, I'll, I'll, wait, I'll wait till the end. Okay, thank you. Yeah. We're trying to get to the end. Mr. Bodner. I think we have a little ways to go, Mr. Mayor. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> um, a comment, uh, Councilor Butters was good enough to um, fill in one of my uh, um, answers to a question earlier, so I'll just add to, uh, to one of her questions about uh, board members becoming um, paid staff. Um, I sit on a, uh, a board um, that gets all of its money from the province of Ontario as a representative from the province of Ontario and a board member has just been elected as executive director of that. Uh, um, so it does happen. Um, you know, um, this person was far and above the best person for the job and it'll be a, um, a real plus for that, uh, for that organization. So I'll just let you know that it does happen. Um, Mr. Mayor, if I can ask, um, first I'll make a statement and, um, you know, it distresses me. Uh, I, I have always held the Niagara Pins Conservation Authority in high regard for, well, as long as I can remember about them anyways. Um, I'm distressed that there is such, uh, um, divisiveness uh, amongst certain members of the public and uh, and the board. And Councillor Elliott asked, just actually stole some of the stuff I was gonna ask about, uh, have you answered, uh, you know, questions that have been brought to you? Um, and I guess I heard the answer, so that, and that's fine. Um, I think when you first came here, the past chair came and said new things were going to happen, right? It was a change. And I remember saying that I was looking for a word to uh, my feelings about the Conservation Authority as far as it related to Port Colburn and especially the rural and the farming community. And I think I said you were a pain in the ass. Um, and and <laughs> If that could be taken good or bad, I, I'm not, you know, it's not really thing, but it has been. There was, there was times when the Conservation Authority would, you know, um, I talked to farmers that it was a wetland, they couldn't farm. The farmer says, I made that wetland 15 years ago, you know, because I was moving stuff around. If you want, I'll make it over here, you know, like, but I want to farm this area. So I see in uh, a letter from, from at least one of the farming community that they're, they, they see a slight improvement in, you know, maybe <coughs> that take you had on you, the board had on, and it isn't the board that makes those decisions. I believe it is the specialists on the ground that make those. Correct. So in that respect, I'm very happy to, uh, to see you've kind of moved forward a little bit in, in those respects. But I'm still very distressed that, that this is going on. I don't think it's healthy for anybody. Um, 
and I'm gonna have more to say, but I'll let somebody else have a go at it. Well, you, you, and I know I really didn't put a question out there, Mr. Mayor. Uh, but, uh, you can say, don't you agree? I did. <laughs> okay. so, um, I, 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 I will say uh, to, to the, the councilor's question, I, I was a town council, a councilor in Fort Erie from 2006 to 2010. And I know we were entertaining many, many motions to dissolve the NPCA back then for those very concerns. Uh, property owners would come forward and they would feel that their private property rights were being trampled upon, uh, that the government was overstepping their bounds, that provincial policy was punitive. Um, we had those same discussions back then. So uh, I think this is an evolution, uh, moving away from the policy creep and, and certainly respecting our mandate and, and focusing our scope and our vision on what our specific mandate is and um, that's what we're trying to do at the Conservation Authority. Mrs. Butters, then Mrs. Emery. Thank you. And then Mr. Doucette, and then Mr. Bonner. Okay. And so um, Mr. We, we just received this handout, and this is uh, produced by whom? That's my first question. Who, who put this together? I haven't seen it. I would believe the communications team like we put that. <coughs> it, but this is but this is something that you you want us to see. Is that is that correct? That's correct. Could you, Do you want to have a look at what it? it is, Mrs. Butters? Well, we all got we all got a copy, okay. sir. Okay. Um, okay. Ashley um, Greg passed us each a, a copy, and I want you to have a look at it. Is that? Accurate? Yes, this is accurate. So All right. I, I think with respect to uh, Mr. Smith's presentation, this tries to answer a lot of the questions okay. that you posed. Can I yes. have that back? Sure. Thanks. Two, two. So um, what I find incredibly disturbing is that, okay, I, and I happen to have the Justice Ramsey's um, decision in front of me. So when I look at, and I want y'all to follow along, because this is but really, no, this is Mr. important, Morris. Mr. Mayor. I, uh, this is important. We are not going to retry this. Case. No, we don't have to. I'm talking about the document that they just gave us, which I take great issue with, absolute issue with, because this document is misleading in itself, sir. And I must continue to point these things out, and I will do it quickly Thank and you. efficiently. Thank you. can do it quickly and efficiently. All right, so if you look at the first one, and it says, Ed Smith said Carmen D'Angelo is the head of an Australian company. Judge ruled wrong. Correct. That's true. Number 64 on this document, which is the Judge, uh, Justice Ramsey's decision. The entry is deliberately misleading. The listing was a forgery as opposed to a mistake. And that's true, it does say that in here. But the rest of the damn sentence is, but there is no reason to assign blame to the defendant. And you leave that out. And that is what happens on each and every one of these. The rest of the story is left out. And I take with that like you would not believe so when you stand there and tell me I want to be transparent I want to be accountable I want to be an upfront guy good for you but this is nonsense I warn the audience that we do not have any outbursts in this council chamber clapping or otherwise notwithstanding Every fiery single Mrs. Butters she's accepted go ahead every single instance number 65 it says on here, Ed Smith said Carmen D'Angelo didn't register his business or pay taxes. Judge ruled wrong, and that's true. Correct. These questions arose out of a mistake caused by an unknown person who uploaded false information to the internet. But the rest of the story is, there was no malice or recklessness with the truth. And that's what you leave off. The next... I, Seriously, it goes on, and, and I could show my fellow counselors the rest of the story on these pages, which they left off to, to make this look like Mr. Smith is a stinker. And you know what? I don't think he is a stinker, but I think this document stinks. Mr. Butters. Sorry, Mr. Mayor, I had to get that off my chest. Okay, okay. But we can't go on like this any longer. Mrs. Demery, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Questions? Surely, short and concise. Yeah. Clear to the point. Not questions. I was just going to sum up 
what, why I'm voting the way I am. Just so that everybody is very clear, I'm going to be casting a vote. I want everyone to know exactly why I'm doing it. Okay. So, and this is this is just how it goes. I absolutely will be voting in support of the motion. Um, I think this this handout that just came around further supports my decision to do that uh, for all the reasons that Councillor Butters just outlaid. But basically, it comes down to this. I think there's been ample ample opportunity to make changes that would have swayed public opinion far before this. And I think everybody sat on their laurels and waited until it became such a hot button issue that they had no choice. And now suddenly there's changes being made. It's just too late in the day for me. When I hear things like scandal plagued, agency gone rogue, agency running amok, culture of harassment and violence, a body that has trouble finding its way, this is not the way a public authority should be referenced at all, ever. There's no excuse for it, none whatsoever. And I do believe that the quickest way to make change, and this is not, I take no exception with any staff member or any decision to put a staff member in place. That, that was before it's happened, that's done. But this is going to the board of directors themselves. The smartest and best way that you could move forward, the highest road you could take is to remove yourself and do it immediately. Put, put in place people that come from an environmental background, an ecological background, watershed management background, and even maybe some city planners. But put, play, put in place people who are experts in the field. Let them direct that authority in the proper way into the future. You have a, a corporate entity on the other side or a, you know, a, 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 the uh, management entity on the other side that takes care of all the others. Let the, the directors direct in the proper manner. But that's the fastest way to go forward in a positive way. It will change public opinion. It'll do it very quickly. And if you don't want to do that, well then fine. Wait until finally enough municipalities stop deferring and start moving forward and actually get uh, the, the <coughs> message through to the province to appoint a supervisor. But that's why I will be supporting it fully and completely. That's it. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Demery. A chance to respond to them. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I have uh, a letter from a constituent who couldn't make it this evening. He wanted to make a presentation. His name is Jack Halinga. Jack, uh, you can, some of you may know Jack very well. Um, but Jack wanted me to read this into, in, in, into the record, and I think it's important. Um, I will not be able to attend the council meeting on Monday night as I will be out of town. I am interested in the position and argument the MPCA's representatives will be presenting. Should they compare their per performance to their mission statement, I have several comments. The board of directors created the mission statement. The reference in the mission statement to support economic development is not a provincial mandate under the Con Conservation Authorities Act. The Conservation Authorities Act makes no mention of economic development. A full, I fully support the proposal to have, a board of, to have a board of directors of the MPCA composed of representatives from each municipality with a background in environmental, ecological, and watershed management. You may share my comments with the remainder of council. Respectfully submitted, Jack Kalinga. That, uh, I can, uh, I believe you have a copy, okay? That was the one thing. The other thing I have to put out here, and, 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 and no matter what happens here, the board of directors is going to have to deal with the fact that communities and citizens in Niagara do not trust you guys anymore. Everything we've talked about goes back to trust, goes back to communications, goes back to being able to tell someone, if someone has a question, you give them an answer. You don't give them a song and dance and run around it, which is what we've been hearing some, somewhat tonight. It's just a song and dance and it's a smoke and mirrors. There's been a lot of smoke and mirrors on tonight. And I'm not saying it's only your, your side. I think both sides are doing some of that because both sides feel like they're being attacked, okay? But if you are doing work for us, the citizens of, of this area and of the Niagara region, you have to have our trust. If you don't have our trust, how do you do the work? Because every time you try to do something, you're gonna be questioned about it, totally. 
because no one will trust any decisions you make. And your board of directors is going to have to find a way to regain that trust from these people. And that's not easy. Once you've lost it, it's very difficult to get back. And I really believe that is going to be part of your process and part of the young lady's communications if she's part of that, because somehow these people have to have answers. Whether you think they deserve it or not doesn't matter. <coughs> because look at everybody here tonight. I'm sure you're going to have same thing in a lot of other communities. How do you regain the trust of all of Niagara, of all of the watershed? Okay? And I mean, I know that at one point I had questions when uh, Carmen came in at one point, and we talked about the whole aquifer. Excuse me, Mr. Doucet. You haven't asked a question. You're giving a long dissertation on your feelings on this issue, which is fine, but it's probably at the wrong stage. Mr. Bodner, okay, has a question. I'll continue later. And then, uh, <laughs> Doesn't matter, Mr. Bodner. No, sir, I do not have a question, but I have a reason why I'm going to vote like I'm going to vote. Okay, we, Are we going to do that? that? That's what we're going to do after. When the vote comes. Yeah. yeah up? I mean, we're okay. Arguing this thing. And That's we, what uh, I was doing. After we ask some questions. So, I don't have any more questions. Okay. Your, 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 your Worship, um, Councillor Doucette made a comment with respect to um, the, the term or the word um, economy or economics within the Conservation Authorities Act. Um, mm. yeah. I made a comment about it. Through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, there's, there's legitimate questions of public policy around the role of a conservation authority as a regulator. They have a technical, legislated responsibility. For instance, in the new Conservation Act, uh, it is now in the Act that uh, conservation authorities can participate in something called a Memorandum of Understanding with its uh, municipalities to advise them on questions of, yes, development. Now, some people may think that's a dirty word, but the regulation of development is four square and squarely within the mandate of the Conservation Authority. They are responsible for providing technical, scientific, dispassionate advice on permitting decisions in floodplains, on subdivision-based development, and like their municipal partners, they must consider the questions of the greater good when commenting on conservation and environmental matters. So to say that they have no stake in questions of economic development is simply factually incorrect. That in this municipality, they've been engaged under the Memorandum of Understanding, providing advice to municipalities, councils like yours who ultimately make the development decisions in this uh, region. Uh, and uh, of course, they have a technical role. They have been deemed the technical specialists. Their mission statement, which I was involved in facil facilitating, simply up, makes that point. They have an act that they need to enforce and regulate, and they, under the MOU here and in many other parts of the province, conservation authorities advise on development matters. It's core to their mandate. Okay, I, th I, th I think that's sufficient, Mr. Anzia. Do you have a question, Mr. May? This is a closing statement. Okay, then we'll go back to Mr. Bonner to make your statements, and I'd ask to keep them as concise as possible. Do not repeat. Can I suggest sure. Those, oh, yeah. poor people, those poor people, I mean, they... Yeah, uh, members of the Conservation Authority, uh, please sit down. It looks like uh, members of council are finished the act of questioning and wish to make their final statements now. Mr. Bonner. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I won't be supporting the motion. Um, what I would like to see, if the motion were to fail, then I certainly would ask that we hold this in abeyance until the, uh, the Auditor General's um, report comes back, uh, which may ask answer a number of those questions. So that's one reason I won't support it, because I think the Auditor General's so you would report. be calling for a motion to defer this until after the Auditor if, General? 
if it if it fails. If it fails. And I would like that to be, because I don't think a notice a notice of motion will pass if people are for it. Uh, but if people are against it, that's the option I'll bring up at uh, after. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else want to make a final statement other than Mr. May? Slaughter. <coughs> I want to continue. No, I want to continue. No, I, I, I got my mind made up. Okay. <laughs> uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, these are just these are my observations from having been on the board, uh, the MPCA board, in a previous term. And back then, Andy Burt was the manager. Mr. Ransom was the chair. Um, it is fair to say that any organization then or now, um, as there's always room for improvement. Um, Andy retired and then Tony DiMario became the MPCA manager. Um, e even back then there was two I would call distinctive kind of groups, um, kind of pro-development group and more um, pro-conservation within that board structure. But that was okay because, you know, Mr. Ansem, um, I think he, he held very balanced meetings and I think the conservation People who worked there did their jobs, and 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 I think there was a balance, and that was that was that was a good thing, and neither outweighed the other. So um, I think things ran, at, at least from my perspective, fairly smooth. Again, this is my observation: the new term, the chair changed, and I still had confidence in the board. I still had confidence in the board. I had no reason not to. But my first concern was when uh, on Tony DiMario's departure. And, and various things started to surface. And we found out who was to take his place eventually, who was a board member. And that board member, you know, did consultant work and he was paid for. And you know what? You can say that a person took a leave of absence and did this or that, but you know what? It leaves it leaves a bad taste. It left a bad taste in my mouth. And then we had like I will call it I'll char characterize it as a purge of some senior managers, many of which I knew them because they reported directly to the board when I was on it. Um, they went out the door. There was years of experience, dedication, um, knowledge, and out they went. And that was disturbing to me. Um, there was all these uh, different things that put together made me more and more worried about what was going on there. And, and as it came to light, more questionable practices in hiring and firing, the watershed department, boom, out it went. That all big, big changes there. More questions and answers. We all had, we all remember Carmen D'Angelo coming here with the biodiversity offsetting road show. Um, that presentation was made to councils across the region. More questions arose from that, whether it was about lobbyists, whether it was about thundering waters, links to the government, links to developers. All these questions, every, every few weeks, it seemed like there was something else perking up. There was a censure of a board member, and we're yet to see the evidence of why that all happened, and, and, and that's never been released. The lawsuits themselves are so disturbing to me. I can honestly say to you, it made me sick to my stomach um, to see all that happen. And then I, I was lucky enough to get this copy of Justice Ramsey's decision. And I just, I need to read to you his words. These aren't mine, these aren't, you know, and there's a guy who's like an objective kind of guy, he's a, he's, a, he's a judge. And he says, I would add something. I share the defendant's disappointment at his treatment by the authority. A private citizen, he raised questions about the governance of the authority. He was met with a public accusation of forgery and the threat of litigation from his own government, as he put it, together with a demand that he issue a written apology, undertake never again to publish the document, which contained many things that are not said to be actionable and reveal his sources. There are many places in the world where I might expect such a thing to happen, but not in our beloved dominion. When I read that, it just, it, it, it chokes me up to think of it now. It, it actually brings me to tears. So if all of you sitting here, and my fellow counselors and Mr. Mayor, if you see these as all just a series of coincidences, 
random events, and no one else sees a pattern of the upset and the turmoil and controversy, and just a serious lack of public trust, mm -hmm. then why do we have the municipal motions that were passed last year asking for the audits? Why do we have three sitting members of our, of our own MPPs who get banded together at Queen's Park to raise these issues? I don't say any of these things in terms of the diminishment of the staff who work for the MPCA. I think they do a fantastic job and they're caught in the middle of a bad thing here. And for that, I, I truly am sorry if it brings them pain and suffering. Um, I think we need to bring this motion forward and, and ask for the provincial supervisor. And I have no doubt the province will do whatever the heck they're gonna do, but the bottom line is it puts in there 60 days. If they don't provide a supervisor, then we're asking for the dissolution of this board. And I can only speak for myself and a lot of people of my constituency um, that have shared their concerns with me. I have, um, I can say the confidence I once had in the MPC A board is lost. My glimmer of hope is in the fact that you, Mayor Maloney, who at Regional Council, you asked for more info on the MPC A budget request of $500,000, and I thank you for that. Um, so far, their request hasn't been granted, and I'm expecting they're gonna have to bring you back more information, and that's a good thing. My other hope is that my fellow councillors around here, this table, will offer their comments and ask questions and, 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 have the, and feel like they've been answered and they will be able to support this um, motion as their conscience will dictate one way or the other. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Everyone on this side is happy with the, the, do you want another kick of the can? Just. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just real quick. I'll support the motion. I guess, to me, in my mind, the only way to get closure on this issue would be to implement a supervisor, much like happened at the NHS when Kevin Smith came to town, came to Niagara, not just the town. There were unanswered questions. Rightly or wrongly, you can assign blame to the board, to management, to, to anybody you want. And although it, it, it seems a punishment and harsh to have somebody come in and take over your position as a board member, it would finally get answers that people are looking for. Have a supervisor come in, have an unbiased look at what's going on. If there's nothing to see here, there's nothing to see here. If there's answers to questions that can be brought forward, so be it. At the end of the time that a supervisor is in place and an audit is done, if there's nothing to see, there's nothing to see. But the answers to questions will have been brought forward. At times it's painful, but I think when you have a public agency and you have the public asking questions about that agency and feel frustrated in the way that questions are being answered or not answered, and I'll, and I'll agree with Councillor Butters. When I read the verdict from the judge and his point about where are we, I thought, I don't, I can't ever remember a judge saying that. And to have it be said about a public agency, to me, is doubly troubling because we pay, it's my money as well as yours, that pay that authority to operate. And an impartial judge says he can't understand why this has got to this point. So let's get to the end of it. Let's get a supervisor in place for however long it takes. Let's get the answers to the questions. And for heaven forbid, let's move on and continue with the good work that the Conservation Authority does because we can all agree that there is good work that the Conservation Authority does. Mm -hmm. And let's get back to doing that. So I will fully support Councillor Butter's motion. Thank you, Mr. Elliott. Mr. Dash, would you uh, have your hand up there? <laughs>
I'm going to sit on the fence because I've heard so much here. And uh, I, I, I love our community and what goes on with our parks. And I camped and fished and all this kind of stuff. But uh, I think it's just a big fishbowl. And everyone's picking on everyone. And to criticize and to say that maybe a supervisor is going to straighten out this mess in 60 days, good luck. Uh, to do that, you had your final statement. Uh, mm, no, I stopped part way through because you told me I couldn't okay, finish. Okay. That's what but happened. That's not, uh, not, not no, no, it's, it's going to be real fast. Believe me. Bottom line is, in my case, I'm going to support it because somehow the Conservation Authority Board has to regain the trust of the people that put them there. Okay? And and without that trust, it just can't happen. I, I don't know how the board itself can do it, and I know there's been changes at the board level, but it doesn't appear to be any real answers to any of the questions. And when, when a citizen asks a question, they should be getting an answer, not smoke and mirrors. And they're getting smoke and mirrors more than answers. So that's why I'm going to be supporting it. And then whatever Ms. Councillor Elliott said and whatever Councillor Butter said, that's my feeling as well. I, I, I fully feel that way. Thank you, Mr. Doucette. Just one comment, uh, Mr. I'm very short, please, Mr. Short as I can make it. Okay. And that's in but the, in, in the council meeting. portion of the agenda tonight. I will be asking for a recorded vote. I can't ask for it now, okay. but in the council portion, I will be asking for a recorded vote. Mr. Main, did you have your final word? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. This is just going to be a real quick comment. We have two sides here. We've got North and the South. They're, they're going to battle it out to the end. I'm interested in the solution. I'm not interested in uh, he said, she said, they said, we said. Uh, the solution is what I'm after. I don't particularly see how a supervisor is going to help us in 60 days. I'm the same with, uh, with Frank. Uh, I think supervisor school probably would take longer than 60 days for a supervisor to come on board. That's the part of this motion that I don't like. Uh, I still believe that we, as a group, unanimously voted to ask the Auditor General to look at the NPCA, and we did that. Uh, I cannot see hiring a secretary before you hire the boss. That's my analogy to it. I would be more than comfortable to have the Auditor General do this legwork, professionally run it, and then have the supervisor look after everything else. Uh, so we can have two votes here because I want to vote to defer this uh, till the Auditor General and the supervisor can do this together because I don't think 60 days is going to work. Uh, unless unless the board wants to fall on the sword, and I might speed it up. But. So it's the time frame that you're suggesting to change? It, it's got to be changed. If, it, if you cannot get, excuse me, Mr. Mayor, this is for me to, to uh, a counterpart here. How can you do it in 60 days? No, it, it, uh, I'm you, just you can't buy a house in 60 days. Do you want to amend the time frame? I want to amend the time frame okay, to, that's, say, that's what I'm asking. to say <laughs> that the supervisor and the auditor general work as a team. Uh, I, you can't expect the supervisor to do the auditor's job, and you can't expect the auditor to do the supervisor's job. We've got one chance to make this right, in my opinion, and for what it's worth, I think that's the way we have to go. Thank you. Mr. Lugie, the, the motion calls for uh, the appointment of a supervisor. And if not within 60 days, the board will be dissolved. Does the Conservation Authority Act allow for that to happen? Sorry. To your, to your worship, uh, I can answer that 100% if you want me to, but uh, I have in my other ear, Councillor Main saying that he made a motion to defer and is looking for a seconder on that motion. So I don't know procedurally what you want me to do first. So, well, is that your motion? Yes. As a, 
audience has indicated there's a motion on the floor. I know. Has it been exception? seconded by anyone? I'll second it. Mr. Daniels seconded it. We have a vote on that now. This is a motion to defer this motion till after the Auditor General com completes her report. No discussion. No discussion. Just a vote. Okay. Okay. Everybody's clear. The deferral's turned on. Then you can vote. Here, say, so the Auditor General heard you say it. Is that a motion? What is your motion, Bill? My motion is to defer this because we've already voted for the Auditor General. I don't see how the supervisor is going to come up to speed in 60 days. So, my, wait a minute, here, I'm talking here, not you, sit there, you, I've listened to you guys, now it's my turn. I beg your pardon, I mean, that's the way I work. I'm having trouble anyway this last couple weeks, but anyway, let's, let's, I want the supervisor and the Auditor General to work together. I do not see how this is going to happen in 60 days. So I wanted to defer this motion until that is in place. Simple. Okay. So I'm not this sure I understand. Motion is the only, the only Mr. Mayor. Way to get a supervisor on board. True. So you have to vote under one, right? You you, 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 well, wait a minute. If, I, if you're going to vote on a deferral, whether you ask him, ask him. No discussion. I'm not saying discussion, Mr. Doucette. I'm saying a vote on a deferral. You can turn the deferral down, can't you? Yes. Okay, that's it. Not discuss the deferral. That's okay, what I'm okay. saying. Okay, Mr. Doucette, I think you should just calm down. No. Okay? Unbelievable. All right. It's all right. We'll get Call for the vote. I ask once again, Madam Clerk. Motion to defer. Does everyone know what they're voting on? Motion to defer. To when? Is, is it just a motion to defer? Just a motion. Yes. Yes. Okay. okay. Then we can vote on the motion. Yeah, then we can vote. All those in favor? One? Of, of the deferral? Yes. Two? Well, three? Frank didn't vote for it. Three in favor? Against? Okay, there you go. One, two, three, four, five. Okay. Motion is so you can do the other one. Yeah, and now we both have one. Back to the main motion. Okay. Moved by, again, Mrs. Butters, and seconded by Mrs. Okay. Demery. The main motion which you have in front of you. All those in favor? One, two, three, four, five. All those against? One, two, three. The motion is carried. There you go. I would ask people to defer their comments, please. The matter is, is that this matter is this actually is over. Concern. If you wish no. to leave, I can adjourn for five minutes and allow you to do so. I'm going to call a five-minute recess, allow the council chamber to clear. Yeah. Or say too, which was really nice. So, well, we had we lost the council. Two. Another delegation. Oh, my almost ripped it off. Suzanne Johnson, who is the president of the Niagara Health System, providing updates on the status of the Urban Care Center and Port Coburn. Other related matters. I wish to apologize to you, Mr. Johnson. Democracy. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mind a bit, really. Oh, no, no. You would uh, have to Thank wait. Thank you for that, but it, it was fine. I um, I got a drive, and my husband's reading his book somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> somewhere out there. It's all good. Thank I you for having me. To him to, as no, well. it's all good. I have your questions. So thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to see all of you once again and to uh, come forward and uh, talk to people. Uh, firstly, I just might say that I was uh, very pleased that uh, the minister came and made an announcement about Niagara Falls and Welland. Uh, we think that's good progress and, and work forward. Uh, lots of work still to be done on the approvals for, for that work in terms of the nitty-gritty pencil. Uh, while we're doing that, uh, in, you know, to directly answer the first question, will the urgent care center um, be uh, closing? 
Uh, no, no changes are anticipated in the services that are here in Port Colborne at all. The only thing that would change that, and it's not different than the answer I provided before, is if the economic uh, future of the province changes and they reduce our budget and we're forced to look at changes, we'll need to do that across the region, as we would at any time. Or if we had a exodus of specialists or care providers and couldn't recruit, we would need to then um, make changes to the services that we do. Otherwise, we're not anticipating any changes in the services. We're going to be putting our energy right now towards getting our um, builds um, approved in terms of what programs and services will be in each of those uh, areas. Whether Welland will be a renovation or a new build, we don't know that yet. So we're working on that. And then as time goes on, we'll begin to see uh, what, what will happen in places other than those areas that are important uh, while recognizing that access to health services is really important. One thing that you might find interesting uh, that certainly uh, was interesting to us on a number of fronts was uh, in the original planning, even for the Niagara Falls built, we did a study of population. And determined that there would be X number of people uh, that would require services in the Niagara region by 2030, by 2040, by 2050. And so um, it's 2017 and we're already at 2022 numbers. So we had to go back around and redo all of the numbers uh, for our build. So it's interesting and it just points to nothing is static, nothing is engraved in stone. and. We need to be able to be responsive to such matters. And so we've done that. And it does mean that uh, you know we would be looking for more beds in that space based on those numbers and service levels. If any of you have been in the emergency rooms in Niagara in the last 18 months, you will also note that our wait times are long, that we are working. I think the teams are working really hard to see everybody that comes in. Uh, I would like to see those wait times shorter. We have um, difficulty in getting people out the back end of our hospital into long-term care. That's why our places in Fort Erie and Port Colborne are so important for convalescent care, for complex care. So uh, it's important business that we do here in this city, and uh, we will continue to do that. That's one question. I'll stop if you like. Any follow-up questions to Suzanne? Uh, Mr. May. Thank you very much for coming and listening to, uh, to what went on here. And uh, I've tried to calm down a little bit. But are you just answering the questions that are, were pre written, or are you taking some? Um, I'm answering the questions I received. Uh, are you prepared on late to ask Friday. any question on? Okay. Yeah. Uh, I just have the list of questions that I received. Through, so. through you, Mr. Mayor, to, uh, to Ms. Johnson. Uh, now, I've mentioned this before about the, the big push they were going to put on at our urgent care center as far as remodeling it goes. Yes. And it seemed that right after the, the election, the sign came down. Is the same thing going to happen with the promises now with the uh, extra money going into Welland? And uh, I know there was a big chunk of money that went to uh, Shaver. So what's going to happen in Port Colborne? I don't see anything happening. Uh, uh, the waiting room is disgusting there, and the washrooms don't meet any code that I know of. Uh, when you've got 30 people waiting in for urgent care, and the, the washroom is just, it doesn't meet code. I mean, even if a person with, needs a handicapped person to get in there, it's not going to happen. So uh, you can answer that one, please, if you don't mind, and we'll have to move on mm -hmm. to another one. So um, on the first question about what's going to happen, I'm, I'm hoping that nothing changes as a result of the work that we're doing. And um, I feel confident in the um, stage we are with our proposals with the capital branch outside of the political level in the work that we've been doing in Welland and Niagara Falls. So I feel that we've been making good strides and that we're in a good place in the uh, capital building project to be able to um, get through that election window. So we're looking for those approvals and moving to Infrastructure Ontario, which will be the team 
that leads that uh, construction project. So I'm feeling good about that, although I'm not, uh, uh, of course, I don't work in the minister's office and I am not a politician, so I can answer from that perspective and I know you appreciate that. On the washrooms, when I saw the note on Friday, of course, I sent that note off to uh, our um, VP in that area. It is messy. I've been told um, about four weeks ago that the urgent care center needs some work. I'm, I'm there quite often and I know that. So I actually asked the team uh, four weeks ago to go in and they're putting forward a proposal for some new furniture and some paint. And, and we did not know, know about the bathroom at that time, but they know now, so we'll look at that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Mayor. Through you to Ms. Johnson. Uh, yeah, the bathroom is a concern for me because I sit on the accessibility committee and I mm -hmm. know there has to be a 10 foot turning area in there. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not gonna happen with that building. Uh, the other question I ha would have would be the, uh, uh, is there any truth to the change in the hours of operation? Are we gonna be a 24 seven or are we gonna be a nine to fiver? I don't believe there's been any changes there under uh, my leadership or direction. So there's been no discussion of changes in operation. We're still 24 seven. Okay, and, and just one final question uh, for me anyway. Uh, and I, I appreciate your answers, and I know you're mostly just the messenger here. Uh, there has been some talk about a new center being built, and uh, you know we see a lot of building around the uh, across the street, the drugstore, and that and big expansion. And the rumor has it uh, it's going to be an urgent care center, private facility run. Uh, and to your knowledge. Is that true or is it false? Um, I'm not aware of that building. I haven't asked them to build one for us. I do know though in Niagara, so for example, in St. Catharines, right across from our hospital, there's a, a building over there that calls itself urgent care and primary care. I don't know if you've seen it. Yeah. Um, I don't know who owns that or who operates it, but there's something there. It hasn't changed anything for us. I wish they, some people would go over there, really, but because <laughs> it's so busy. But I, I have no knowledge of that. Okay. No. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Any other questions? Madam Demery and Madam Butters. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you, Ms. Johnson. Um, just further to Ms. Uh, Councillor Main's uh, the, the subject on the uh, urgent care possibly changing or a, a private mm -hmm. facility being built. Right. I, is there any plan at all to see uh, P3 type urgent cares happen in Niagara? Um, the new hospital at Niagara Falls will be a P3 and it will have an urgent care in there like it does in St. Catharines next to Emerge. Okay. That's the only one because that will be built through Infrastructure Ontario. Okay. Yeah. And as a P3, will there be any user fees involved there? No. Okay. Just Thank the you. same as it is today. Thank yeah. you. Infrastructure Ontario does all of the builds now, the capital builds, the financing. Yeah. Mrs. Butter. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you to uh, Mrs. Johnson. Um, thanks for being here. Appreciate it. Um, I was just at a meeting um, the other night, and uh, one of the issues raised was the how expensive it is to uh, to park and so if you're going up to the Walker Center or up to, I'll just say the new St. Catharines Hospital mm -hmm. uh, for whatever tests or whatever you might need that 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 cost is just so um, it's hard on people mm -hmm. it, and I mean I put in my comment you know could you apply for a license to get slot machines so you mm -hmm. could be like a casino and, and be free you know mm -hmm. um, kind of tongue-in-cheek but you know is there is there not a way to to help these folks who who really really have a hard hard time especially if they have to go you know it's one thing if you got to go there once and pay like eight bucks but if you got to be there three times a week mm -hmm. boy oh boy yeah. that right. it gets really really hard it on does. people I, I understand that absolutely and um, it's not an excuse or anything we follow the mandate from the ministry on parking with our facilities and uh, there is a uh, parking policy uh, that I'd be happy to send uh, through for you. Uh, and you will see in there um, the opportunities that are in there for people to buy different kinds of passes right. uh, that would make it a little less burdensome. For some of our patients that come regularly, 
uh, for dialysis and, and for those treatments we do have uh, I, some leniency, but, but it, is a, it is a burden and it is part of the provincial landscape on parking at hospitals across. And if I may continue, so in terms of like providing like the health care and in that system that you work in, like what kind of <coughs> advocacy can you provide um, for issues like that? Because if it comes from the, a ministry level, you know, higher up the food chain, you might say, Mm -hmm. At what point do they kind of do they get feedback from you to, to say like boy oh boy, you know we got we got some people that are suffering here we, financially. We so is there an opportunity? We regularly meet with the MPPs and, and give feedback where we're able to. Uh, the Ontario Hospital Association is a body that does lobby the province for hospitals, but it is uh, it is a it is a tough one. There is no doubt. And then I only learned this morning that we actually gave parking tickets. Um, to mm -hmm. everybody here in Port Colborne oh, that yeah. came to the Remembrance Day ceremony. Yeah. So we oh, fixed yeah. that. Thank um, you. And so we would only ask in future if we know ahead of time we can avoid the stress of that. So I appreciate the yeah. fact that that yeah. was remedied. Um, so my apologies to that. Thank you. I got a parking ticket in St. Catharines <laughs> on Remembrance Day. Just for the record. <laughs> I don't like the mayor there as much. <laughs> for the record. Anyway, I'm, I'm not joking about it. It is, uh, it is hard, and it's hard for the staff who are assigned to give parking tickets. And if, they, if we know ahead, we can say don't, don't go do out that. there and ticket yeah. between A and B on that day. Okay. And my last question is in regards to the Welland Hospital. And what yeah. can we reasonably expect yeah. to be coming up the pike? So, um, some pr so really the plans for the Welland uh, build are really not a whole lot different than what they were originally in our original uh, submission, other than the hours of uh, services and emergency. And so uh, we hadn't decided on the hours because we were waiting to see what the demand would be. And so we would expect to have dialysis there. We would expect to have um, all the diagnostics that are there today, uh, breast screening, CAT scan, lab, x-ray. We would expect to have probably eyes, ophthalmology, uh, day surgery running there like it does now. Um, we'll have to sort out some uh, design work between the um, clean and dirty areas in terms of the architectural work that some expert will help us with. You need so much space to do that. Um, but if it's not eyes, it'll be some kind of uh, ambulatory surgery program. But eyes make sense. It's there. We will have um, addictions treatment there in our mental health. We will have a multiple um, visiting specialist, depending on the needs of the population. And we're working with the primary health teams there to see what that might look like. We would expect to have probably about 30 uh, complex built within the long-term care facility that will be a new build. So on the corner of King and Third, we are going to build a new long-term care. So right now, if you were in the Welland Hospital, you would see a long-term care and complex care side by side. And so we're just going to kind of move that into a new build. Uh, we have 145 um, licenses right now, 45 of which are temporary or interim. And so we would like to see those licenses converted to permanent for us. But we will then add another 30 beds, which would be complex care. And when you think about the care of that population, in my clinical expertise, what you want is recreation therapy, physiotherapy, socialization, activity, and so they would be well situated to be in that partnership in a new build, and they're right there, and you would also have some nice green space, and they wouldn't be in the other spot, which is busy with ambulance and 24-hour and emergency services, and holding beds, 8 to 10, 10 to 12, not sure of the number yet, so if you think you've got something or if you're being monitored, uh, you could potentially be monitored and then discharged home or potentially monitored and discharged to a higher level of care. What about acute care? No acute care beds, no. no. So that's the uh, gist of uh, services there. Yeah. 
and French language speaking services as well. Natalia. Thank you. Uh, just, just a quick question on an answer that you had previously given with re regards to emergency rooms um, and population increase. And we are already at 2017. You said we are at the 2022 mm -hmm. threshold for population um, and the amount of wait times in emergency. Yeah. What is NHS doing to somewhat alleviate wait times knowing that yeah. We're five years ahead of the population curve <laughs> now, probably going to exceed that and exponentially over the next few years. Right. And I know that while it's great that the new build has been announced in Niagara Falls, sometimes you come along speed bumps along the way and maybe the build gets pushed back. So right. going forward until the new hospital is up and running and any other emergencies or UCCs are, are built or mm -hmm. redone, what does NHS foresee to try to alleviate the wait times? So, uh, great question. <laughs> and uh, we pray. I have uh, an app on my phone that uh, every day, which I look at before I go to bed, first thing in the morning, to see how many people are waiting in our emergency rooms and urgent care centers, how many people have been admitted in the time since I last looked uh, and have no bed, so they're in a stretcher. <clears throat> How many alternate level of care patients do we have across the system, which means that those are individuals who would be better cared for in another spot. How many people are waiting for long-term care? So I have all of those numbers at my fingertips at any one moment, and mostly that dashboard is red. Uh, we are running at about 150 beds more than we have budget for right now and have been for quite a while. So anywhere between 100 to 150 beds, we're operating um, daily, meaning that we're working our staff harder, overtime harder, our budget pressures are significant, our um, ability to move people out of the acute care system into alternate levels of care is not as uh, good as it could be if there were more long-term care beds available. Uh, the, the local health integrated network has been a very good partner. And through the ministry, we've received funding for another 26 uh, beds that we've just opened in Welland. Uh, on uh, in a, a unit that wasn't uh, operating. So we've just opened and staffed another 26 beds. Uh, there may be more beds coming, we don't know, but we will take them and we're ready. We have space where we can do that across our system, so we're lucky. We um, also um, have um, leaned every process that we could lean in emergency rooms. So we're doing all of that work while we are able to with, within the walls, what we have control over. And uh, we're moving people through. Our integrated comprehensive care program has been a very uh, high performer. And that means if you've got congestive heart failure or chronic obstructive lung disease, you could become enrolled in a program that has advanced co care coordination, home care services. And we've been able to discharge people sooner uh, and safely to their home where people like to be uh, with 24-hour uh, access to a care coordinator nurse that they can call if they feel like they need some guidance or direction. And we have reduced uh, their readmission rate substantially. In fact, in the Lynn, we're the best performer on the ICC program, which is what it's known for. So more of that in other disease entities. We're gonna start in January with mental health. It's an area that we believe we could support better as well in new and different models. So we're looking at that at every opportunity. Anything to keep people from coming in and, and what maybe you don't know, I, I was shocked when I read it and we often follow United States in trends in care. In the United States of America, there are three top killers of people cancer, heart disease, and hospitalization. So the more we keep people out of hospital, the better off people will be in that they should come to hospital when they need to get uh, a gallbladder out, a heart valve blown out, 
a surgery, and then back home again into an environment with good home care. With the Lynn recent transfer under the patient first legislation for home care, we're very hopeful that we're gonna be able to have more partnerships like that with home care, and that we'd be able to do more kind of bringing people through and out the door in a safe and, and way that people are comfortable with, not just tossing people out, because that doesn't work. I hope I answered your question. Perfectly, and, okay. and, and this may be a little bit of an unfair question. Do you ever foresee us getting into gridlock where there's just too many people and you just can't deal, the, the system just can't deal with the pressure? And, and, and as I say, that may be yeah. unfair, but when you look at the expansion yeah. of wait times, yeah. you gotta think, do we get to that pressure point that it's tough to get everybody in? Well, um, good question too. You know, St. Peter's had a fire not long ago down in the Hamilton area. And it was a Sunday afternoon and I got a call, can you get beds for people in St. Peter's? And you know what, Niagara can do it. We can rally. If we need to rally, we can rally. We've had to buy more beds. We actually had to buy more beds using capital equipment that we, money that we really wanted for something else, but we needed to buy the beds. So we had to buy those 26 beds to open that unit because you need the right beds. You can't have people in the wrong ones or staff working dangerously. But um, potentially, I suppose, anything can happen. I think we have enough flex in our areas uh, right now that we're okay, and we have a great partnership with Shaver, another really good healthcare partner. So I feel like uh, we're okay, but it, it, it's, there's a lot of anxiety in the system, and people are tired and maybe a bit grumpy. And, and yet I get so many good compliments from people who said, you know what, I was in emergency, it was miserable waiting, but they took good care of me, they treated me well, and thank you. And, and I, it's right across the board. So even though we're there, we're still over here. So it could happen. I hope it doesn't. Yeah. So. Mr. Doucette. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Um, very simple question. It's, I was in the Emerge about, a, about two months ago here in Port. And the doctors that are in Emerge here and in Welland, I've seen them in Welland as well, are excellent, okay? I have no complaints about the doctors. It's the quantity of doctors. Who does the scheduling? And the reason I'm saying that is the guy here in Port, when I was there, um, I mean, he must have been seeing 15, 20 patients in an hour, if he could, He's pushing, he's pushing the envelope. But uh, I would tend to believe that at one point, would there not be a need for another doctor to come in there? And, 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 and like I said, it, it seems like a very simple question, but it's something I've been thinking of over and over again. And in Welland, it's the same issue. In Welland, when you're waiting six, seven, eight hours, could there not be doctors on call that say, come on in, I mean, we, we just need you. But I don't know if, who does that. And, and I, I know the stories I've heard about, it's, it's not the NHS, it's a company that's hired to do it, and, and, I, and I couldn't care less. We need a doctor, we should be getting a doctor in mm -hmm. to help with the mm -hmm. load. Mm -hmm. Because it's not their fault, and then what happens is the doctors get, and the nurses get all upset, because the patients are upset, and then you just create a circle there that just, you can't resolve. Um, so can you answer that question? Who does the scheduling for eMERGE and UCC and that kind of stuff? Our, our chiefs of staff do it. Um, so what I would suggest, with your indulgence, is that we invite our chief of staff out to give an overview of that. We do that, if that would work, because I'd like he'd to be better that. able okay. to do that than I would. Okay. I think you'd get a better, Yep. understanding of the bigger picture because it's about availability of stretchers because people say just hire more doctors no, and, and it's not it but just on that could I just I know we're gonna be here late but since we're up um, uh, we've hired about 19 new specialists into Niagara Health in the last three years 
fine, fine, fine physicians. Pretty impressive crowd. A lot of them moving here with their families. It's, it's very good to see that kind of energy. And a lot of local kids who went off to medical school coming back as couples. And it's kind of nice because that's the people who stay, right? So I think that's a very favorable thing. Thank you very much. Thanks. Anyone else on my left? Am I right, Barbara Butters? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. When you talked about being 150 beds over what you <coughs> budgeted for, and then they allotted you 26, so then you, and, and is that like 150 a pretty constant number of need? No, it fluctuates. But it, would it be like, would that be like 150 would be like a top, That'd be a top, top end, yeah. and then, so That'd then what top. does it, it drop to? Yeah. Could be, you know, 70 has been pretty regular. I bet yeah. if I look right now, it's probably 70, 72. Yeah. And, it, and it just kind of makes me wonder, like, so so you really need 70, more, more closer to 70. So who makes that decision that, that it gives you 26 when clearly well, it would be... Well, I think it was a, a, an allocation of affordability because they went right across the province. All of Ontario is yeah. feeling that huge pressure of... Okay. Seniors. So the saddest part of it for me, and, and when I look on that little dashboard, the people who are waiting are in the medicine program. And so as a nurse, when I look at the medicine program, I know who that is. It's somebody in their 80s. They may have had a um, fall in their home. They may be starting to get dementia and maybe wandering a bit. Their family lives in Vancouver or mm -hmm. Ottawa, and they're alone with a spouse who all of a sudden needed them, and so that partnership's falling apart, and that person ends up in the emergency room. Yeah. And you're laying on a stretcher in an emergency room, and you lose 5% every day of your physical ability. Every 12 hours on that stretcher, you're deteriorating, you're becoming disoriented. So when you look at who is coming to our emergency room, it's senior citizens for the most part. You still have motor vehicle accidents. You mm -hmm. still have a lot of mental health and addictions issues with the opioid crisis, a lot of chest pain, cardiac, but a lot of people in the medicine program. And, and so then what's the trajectory and the next steps for families? So it's, it's really challenging and um, I teach in McMaster and at Brock, and I had a student uh, that I'm just finishing up with this term. And she said, Suzanne, she said, it's so hard for me as a nurse to, to try to do everything I can to get services for somebody at home and not be able to get them. What do I do? And she's like 21, right? Whole career ahead of her thinking and feeling <laughs> that pressure. I mean, yeah. those are the kinds of professionals we need to support and be present with, right? So. It's really hard for staff to want to do the right thing sometimes. So, you know, I think we have a good team that's present. Uh, we are in our sites every day across Niagara. The executive team is out supporting the teams. Our engagement scores, uh, amazing high, and we just repeated them again in eight months, and they're continuing to grow. Our reputation polling on trust and transparency over the last three years is improving. So there's a lot of good happening, and we're faced with crushing numbers someday. And I, I said the other day, surely we've looked every, after everybody now in Niagara at least once. All 500,000 people have been in here. <laughs> so now we must have them on a good track, but it, it's tough. Yeah, so thank you. If there are no further questions, I would conclude this portion of our meeting and thank you thank once you. again. My pleasure. Whenever you like, uh, just call and I'll bring Dr. Stewart um, and uh, we'll give you a story on the medical side because I think you'll really uh, enjoy that. We'll make a date in the new year. Yeah, very good. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Thank you very good night. much. Okay. If I go back to our agenda, next on the agenda is the mayor's report. I have a few brief issues to report on. First of all is the retirement of Dr. Enrique Gomez. I attended uh, a small gathering, uh, our medical recruitment committee 
to congratulate Dr. Gomez on his retirement after 60 years of practicing medicine, uh, and 46 of those were in the city of Fort Coburn. So we were happy to have Dr. <laughs> Gomez for 60, 46 years. And he was very appreciative of the acknowledgement. Uh, I also attended St. Teresa's anti-bullying campaign. Um, that when they kicked off this at uh, St. Teresa's Catholic Elementary School. Uh, one final reminder about Christmas in Burke Coburn. Um, the events of the season are upcoming as we enter, enter the Christmas season. Children will enjoy Santa arriving by tugboat this Saturday, December 2nd, around 1 p.m. Santa then will make a return visit on a sleigh during the annual Light Santa Claus Parade, which starts at 6.30 p.m. the same evening, that's December 2nd. During the day on Sunday, December 3rd, the Fort Copeland Museum grounds will be filled with memories of past Christmases during the grand old Christmas event. Uh, that's always fun, and we encourage you to come out and enjoy the festivities. Christmas pudding in Arabella's Tea Room, etc. And uh, I'd also like to point out that our shop owners are also ready for the Christmas season. No need to leave the city to uh, get your shopping done. There are many businesses here already decked out for Christmas with all your shopping favorites and some good quality merchandise that uh, I encourage you to shop locally. That is the extent of my report this evening. I'd like to call on our regional counselor, uh, Mr. Barrick. Uh, is he still with us? Perhaps uh, he was here right from the beginning. Uh, he's left uh, here. If he reappears, we'll uh, insert him in the agenda. Now, moving on to counselor's items. We've done item number one. <coughs> yeah, well, I'd say we already have done uh, counselor's I, I, item number one. We've done. But, uh, or oh, the council's inquiries. Mrs. Butters. Well, it's not so much of an inquiry, but it's a big thank you to a bunch of people who donated lights for King George Park. Um, I don't know if you've had a chance to see it lit up, but it's absolutely beautiful. Um, so Andrea Burrell, Judith Baroniak, Rick and Debbie Geedy, Nick Finnamore, Vivian Eggleton, um, Audrey Garrett, Noreen Lannan, Janet Stepanchuk, Gail Todd, Ron and Claire Bodner, uh, B. Kenny, John Tuck, and Darlene. And um, they, uh, John and, and Darlene also donated a pair of angels that are supposed to be going in. I'm not sure if they're there yet, but um, my thanks to, to Jim um, and the staff to just did an amazing job. I was so excited. I, uh, one, of, one of the people said, oh, the lights are up, and I ran into town to take a picture. I was so excited to see it. And it looks beautiful. It just looks beautiful. So thanks, everyone, for, for doing that. And the mayor, as, as well, donated um, lights, as too. So we really appreciate everybody's um, participation. This Sunday, December 3rd, Shirkston Community Center is the um, amazing Christmas potluck. So um, certainly, our staff and counselors and your spouses, please feel free to, to come on over and join us. It's lots of fun. Um, Santa shows up. Um, it, it's a really nice family event, and we'd love to have you there. So uh, I think that's all I, I have, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes, Mr. Elliott. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, just a... Uh, direction to staff and I guess I'll put it through the CAO and maybe he can figure out who wants to um, maybe engineering operations good place we had a, uh, a CIP open house not too long ago and um, there were some accusations uh, lobbied about about us not applying for federal grants and any grants um, in particular 
and I was just wondering if it would be appropriate for staff to write a quick report um, and I don't care if we get it in next cycle or uh, in January um, just outlining the the funding that is available that they've seen through the federal government and why we didn't apply for it um, I think I've had a conversation with Mr. Hoopinen and uh, Chris about uh, what we don't qualify for. Um, but just to get it out there to people that, yes, while there is funding from the federal level and maybe even the provincial level, the stringent guidelines that are being placed on funds, we just don't qualify for right now. Um, it's not that we don't want funding and we have received I don't want to get it out to too many other municipalities but we do seem to receive a fair fair share of funding for some of our projects but it's not that we're not applying it's just that we don't meet the criteria that that the feds have put on um, some of the funds that uh, that they've the uh, that they've set aside so I was just wondering if we could do that in a quick report um, just outlining <coughs> why we didn't apply and maybe we can uh, remove some of those questions from uh, for some people. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Uh, I think we've, Mr. Louie and I have discussed this way back, and uh, we will uh, undertake that suggestion. Mr. Dissent, Mr. Bowder. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Um, maybe for um, Jim. Um, they're finishing they appear to be finishing some of the work um, in the East Village things are going pretty good the only issue I have is I go riding there and every couple of days I go take a ride to see what the progress is and I find it interesting that in on some streets as you're going down the street some areas have been repaved and then right next to it, about three feet further, you have an area that hasn't been paved. And then you go a little further and another area has been paved and so on. Is everything going to be paved eventually? I, I, I'm being asked that question. Or is, is, this, is this only a temporary patch until next spring? What exactly is going on? Because I, I'm being questioned about that. And, and I know they're working hard at trying to get it done, but what's the process? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, to uh, Council Doucette. The, the plan is to have everything with hard surface uh, in that complete area for that project. Um, what you might be seeing is where they've done, the way the work has been done, there's been a lot of staged work uh, in order to get the storm sewer in. There's been having to be water mains lowered, uh, gas lines lowered, things like that, that, you know, uh, all the conflicts with infrastructure. So, so I think what they've done is the work that was done earlier in the project has been paved and then the next section that is you know the stone trench beside it was for the storm sewer that went in or whatnot other utility um, so the plan is I know they've been working on um, trying to get asphalt down on areas where that's done the other reason for a trench being still stone is that they may have to go back and do some final connections um, to that infrastructure to tie it into either properties or other cross streets and things like that. So I know the plan was to get all the asphalt down prior to um, the winter season setting in. Uh, so far, I don't, I don't jinx us, but knock on wood, we've been quite lucky um, to be progressing as far as we are. The plan is to have the project done by the, uh, the deadline of October, or not October, De December 22nd, I believe was the deadline. Uh, a follow-up to that. Um, there are areas where uh, the holes are horrible. Um, an, an example of that is as you turn to go around to come, uh, as you're coming off of Charlotte that turns into Welland and you're turning into the East Village, there's a couple of areas there where some of the holes are about a foot deep. Um, and, uh, and they're working way at the other end, and I understand that. But somehow we've got to find a way. I mean, someone's going to blow out a tire or blow out a, a spring or something's going to happen. I don't know what. So I don't know if they need to maybe check them out every once in a while and put something down or, or scrape. But 
some of the holes are horrible um, and dangerous to the cars and to the pedestrians, actually. So and if you could just mention that to the contractor, and I know Chris has mentioned a few times that, you know, there's some issues there, but um, maybe have a chat with them and say, go back and check a couple of places because some of the holes are unbelievable. Yeah, through you, uh, Mr. Mayor, to Councilor Doucette. Uh, yes, it, the contractor is ultimately responsible to make sure the uh, area is safe and passable. I will pass on your concerns regarding the potholes. Uh, I know they, they do drive it, and it maybe it's just a matter of us uh, identifying some key areas that we have concern that maybe they're not uh, looking after as, as good as they should be, so. Thank you very much. You're fine, uh, Mr. Bissett, then? Yeah, I'm fine. Mr. Bobner, do you have anything? Yes, Mr. Mayor, thank you. Um, just wonder whether you get counselor, council support <coughs> and uh, having staff <laughs> look into the um, continued Pleasant Beach uh, garbage issue. Councillor Butters fielded the question again yesterday, today. You called me this morning, so. Yes, I could tell, uh, sorry. And I think you had a few during the day today, by this way. Anyways, uh, um, look, we've got a new enclosure there. We've got a chance to put something in place to make this work. And quite frankly, I don't want to hear why we can't do it. I want to hear how we can do it. Let's put some freaking cameras up there. I just I went out there this afternoon. Somebody dumped a load of drywall by the mattress that somebody else dropped. That, anyways, there's more to that mattress story than, you know, Council Butters could fill you in. But um, look. Somebody had to put that drywall in their vehicle and drive it there and then unload it for another 10 minutes. They could have went to the dump in Welland. Like, and this is going to happen. This is, we're either going to say, oh, too bad, so sad, that's the way it is, or we're going to do something about it. So I'm asking if staff could figure out a way that we can put cameras up there and by the way, let's make sure we got all our bylaws in place so we can actually charge people, not just warn them, you know. And <laughs> if it turns out to be local residents, double a freaking fine. Sorry. Mr. Um, Mr. Hoffman, do you have a comment? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, to uh, Councillor Bodner. Um, I actually <laughs> did talk to our regional staff today um, regarding the operation of the uh, Pleasant Beach Waste Enclosure. Um, there was there was some discussion on, on when it would be put in operation at the previous council meeting. Um, I did talk to regional staff today and there is um, thoughts on uh, exp 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 speeding up the process of getting it up and running. Um, there is a discussion of having a lock on it that has a keypad for residents to be able to access it. Um, and we do have, a, I think, um, three or four permanent residents in that area that this would service. So I am in discussion with the region about getting uh, the fine details of accessing it and all that. And they will be doing the notification to the residents that are currently there um, and also to the um, part-time residents that come back in the springtime, I guess, or summer season. So we are working on that. We're hoping that we can uh, hopefully get something resolved. Um, sooner than the spring, obviously. We are currently uh, in the process of trying to uh, find a lock that will work with the type of enclosure we have with the wood uh, doors and that. Um, so we are working on that. As for the cameras, I'll have to uh, look into that a little bit further to see uh, if that is a possibility, if that's what Council's uh, direction is on that. Um, as for the large items that are getting dumped there, uh, I just want to remind that a region is responsible for the bulk item pickup. The region is responsible for our, all garbage pickup in the city, um, whether it's uh, municipal roads or regional roads. Um, so if there is a large bulk items being dropped there uh, illegally, um, I will notify the region of this um, uh, issue so that they can investigate it. They have their whole process that they do for illegal dumping uh, and things of that nature. And um, also remind I guess, uh, council and residents uh, watching that the region does have a um, hotline for illegal dumping um, 
and they would like to talk directly to the resident calling it in as they have a list of detailed questions they'd like to ask. So we will look into uh, councillor's concerns. And there are financial rewards to <coughs> those who report illegal dumping paid by the region. And I think uh, certainly su surveillance equipment is overdue. Yes, uh, Mr. Jack, will you? Just to add, Mr. Mayor, the region has a, a fine, and the city has a fine too. That if people are convicted, charged, then there there's a three hundred dollar reward for that individual. That's what I was referring to. Thank you, Mr. Aquilina. Yes. Anything else, Mr. Minor? Well, I guess because we have budget coming up, that financial part of that is is important. Complete package, not you know some little kid's camera that's you know stuck in the fence or something we need something that's gonna you know get results and probably more than one um and if they're portable and everything is good and we can move them to some other area that's that's fine too so, thank you thank you mr bodner mr demaray and mrs <laughs> thank you mr mayor yes, <laughs> Just uh, so Councillor Bodner knows, uh, Councillor Maine has, has volunteered to go park out out uh, out there and look at watch for the garbage dumpers so that he can make some extra Christmas money. So, okay, listen, yes. sorry for three hundred bucks, stay in your own ward. I'm going to be okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay, uh, my my um, my question is again about it's also about the East Village uh, construction and what's happening there. Um, just so Councillor Desette knows, they did. Uh, fill in quite a few of those holes today so it's not as bad um, there's no spring breakers left so that that's a good thing um, and obviously they are getting the curbs are, are now pretty much all restored the sidewalks are not that that's uh, hopefully that's going to happen real soon because walking in the area is next to impossible so hopefully that'll happen but I did have a question from um, one of the residents today regarding uh, the ripped up lawns and I'm actually going to be one of those residents as well because uh, as a result of some of the large machinery that had to come on to the front lawns our front lawns are gone now <laughs> they were just they, they got all ripped up in the tracks of the, of the machinery so I'm just uh, wondering will sod be replaced next spring I can't imagine doing it now there's not much point but in the spring yeah, through you, Mr. Mayor, to uh, Councilor DeMarie. Uh, typically, sod re reinstatement does occur in the spring. Um, it's touch and go this time of year um, with frost and things like that. If it is, if it is possible to lay sod, um, depending on, I know they will they will make those areas smooth, so at least it's not big um, divots and things like that in the uh, in the grass area. And then you know they'll do their final prep uh, for reinstatement in the spring if we don't get it done this year. Um, as for sidewalks, um, that's part of the hard surfacing, getting it done. Um, I will discuss with them to make sure that they are safe and passable. If they are not hard surface with the permanent concrete, um, this before the winter time comes. So we will definitely look at that and make sure that it is they are safe and passable for uh, the winter season if the permanent concrete is not installed. Thank you very much. I just I want to be able to tell the residents yes, yes, sod will be replaced, but it would be pointless to do that now. It it, it needs to happen in the spring, and if the sidewalks um, do not get all of them get done, could we be sure that whatever is going to replace that that structure that it be something that can be shoveled off because that's that's the other issue. So uh, as long as we can, I can assure them that the, that's going to be taken care of. Uh, everything's good. Thank you, Mr. Demery. You're here to comment. Uh, do you want me to or no? <laughs> Through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor. Uh, yeah, I will look into that and make sure that there is um, some kind of hard surface temporary if, if need be. Mrs. Kenny. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you to Mr. Hunnigan. I thought this week, I thought we were going to get a report back on the intersection of Catherine and uh, Clarence. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, to Councillor Kenny. The report was prepared. Uh, some comments from uh, some of the departments uh, weren't uh, readily uh, available or, or finished off by the council report deadline. Um, so it is coming to the December 11th. Um, and that was one of my staff updates, so you took that away from me. So, um, so yeah, it will be coming to the December 11th council meeting. <laughs> right. 
would you like to comment on that now? Uh, Steele and Elg and I will be bringing a report uh, forward at December 11th meeting as well. Mrs. Butters, I see you winking. Uh, okay, that would appear to conclude our councillors' uh, inquiries. Staff of Swazis, Chief, do you have any comments on the... Yes, I do, Your Worship. Thank you very much for the opportunity. I'll try to keep it as short as I can. Um, I probably should have said some of this when we had a bigger crowd. Maybe it would have helped them too. But nonetheless, uh, just a reminder to everybody that uh, uh, during the course of the Santa Claus Parade this Saturday, we'll be collecting toys for the uh, toy drive, as well as we're continuing those efforts over the course of uh, the next week or so uh, throughout different depots within the city that are listed on our website and also the city's website. Uh, as well, there's a teddy bear toss this Friday night that's going to take place uh, in between periods at, uh, at our arena in the city. Uh, we're working that out. Scott's working that out with our uh, hockey team of the city. So that is a thing that happened last year, and we're going to continue with it this year. So those are a couple of good news things, uh, together with the fact we're still continuing with our smoke alarm program in the city. And uh, you'll see in 2018, we're going to try to change it up a little wee bit to make it a little more uh, uh, beneficial to individuals who do comply with the, the fire codes rather than enforcement. We're going to try to turn the tables and try to induce uh, more compliance through uh, rewards. But that will be announced to council in, uh, in the new year. The one thing I do want to, uh, another thing I do want to talk about is a recent call we had uh, two weeks ago Sunday at a home. Uh, it was a, a, a renter. The, um, the homeowner uh, was able to provide us with records that they, in fact, had uh, provided smoke alarms throughout and carbon monoxide alarms throughout. Uh, there was a fire in the basement. Uh, uh, the, the people who lived there denied that uh, they smoked. Unfortunately for them, we were able to find a number of cigarette butts uh, in the basement and throughout the house, as well as uh, some illegal devices that they were also enjoying in the basement. And I guess it, the smoke alarm that was in the basement was bothering them, so they had they took it down, as well as they disarmed the carbon monoxide alarm. So we'll be charging the individual that rents that house uh, for both those counts. Uh, in a recent court case, we got a $700 fine against an individual. I would hope that uh, given these circumstances, uh, especially since there was an infant child and a two-year-old child in the house, uh, I was rather upset, to say the least, and I conveyed that to the, uh, the renter. Uh, I reminded them of what happened here last December in not so many words, but the reality of the situation is we're going to charge them, take them to court, and uh, we're going to be pleading our case to the judge to lay down the law. Thank you, Chief. Mr. Sinness, is there any update on possible budget discussions? Yes, Mr. Mayor, I was going to uh, just make council aware that uh, we are running um, a little behind, um, and I know that you were looking forward to seeing a budget in December. Uh, but it probably be coming uh, in uh, January. Um, we're just running behind with the new financial system being put in and so on, which 2018, <laughs> not 19. Well, we'll be doing one in 19 too. So, uh, but that is uh, we're just a, a bit behind in in, uh, in our work <coughs> with regard to that. So uh, that'll be coming forward and bringing forward in January, and we'll be setting up some meetings. Okay, is there anyone else? Yes, Madam Hoban. Uh, three, Mr. Mayor, just to counsel, just to update on the trees, uh, Christmas lights at King George Park, the um, smaller uh, additional trees, I've seen them in the yard today. So they are, they did find a solar powered, solar powered light option for those trees as well. So they were um, getting them ready today. So they should be out there this week sometime. Um, uh, just to add on the Pleasant Beach waste uh, compound um, item we discussed previously, um, just a reminder that until we do the official, I guess, opening of this uh, waste enclosure, that residents are still to follow the status quo of putting their garbage at the end of the laneways um, and to, for the region to pick up. Also, even when this enclosure is put into use, the bulk items will still be picked up by the region at the end of the laneway. They will not be picked up at the waste. Enclosure. So I'll make sure that um, there is wording in the region's letter that gets distributed to um, residents when we get to that point. Um, uh, the councillor Maine's request, I believe, regarding um, Mrs. Biker that was in council, uh, stopped by council last meeting. 
Um, our staff was out there Friday and we have issued uh, work orders for our crews to go out and do some um, repairs on the sidewalk and also for the drainage uh, concerns. Um, the list of reinstatements uh, the Councillor Main had provided by email, uh, they are on the list to be completed this year. We're just waiting on our contractors to come back and do that work. Um, uh, I think that's it. Okay, that would appear to conclude this portion of the meeting. Yes, Mr. Rodney? Can I just uh, say that on that Pleasant Beach uh, enclosure, if we need any signage that will allow us to find somebody, you know, like don't be stupid and dump things here, something, I don't know, whatever it has to say, but, you know, you don't want to have, you know, we've done that before, we say no parking, then we don't have the right signs and he can't charge them. Let's make sure if you could check with Dan's department and get all the whatever we need on there or the region um, well before we put up any cameras or anything. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bonder. Okay, let's move on the agenda. Moving on to consideration of those items requiring separate discussion. We have number one, uh, number four. Dave Elliott has number four. David, can you talk to number four? I apologize, Mr. Mayor. Um, planning development report uh, number 2017-150, subject Meadow Heights Subdivision Agreement Amendment, phase two. Is there a recommendation? Seconded? Seconded by uh, Councilor Bench. Any discussion? <coughs> Mr. I'll turn it over to the Director of Planning. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you to Councilor Elliott, and I appreciate the item being pulled. There was one item that was on page 66 of the addendum report, and that deals with Schedule P, and that's the security deposits of the subdivision. There were a couple errors that were uh, noted, and I just would like to... Uh, raise them tonight for council's consideration. The one item was the deposit under inspection charges. It was reported it was $31,312, when in fact the correction is $21,948.20. The cash deposit was incorrect as well on, under that item. It was cited as $31,312, when in fact it is to be $21,948.20. And for a total under this Schedule P, for the letter of credit, it was reported at $409,059.95, when in fact the corrected amount is $375,747.50. And the last item under the cash deposit, it was noted that it was $31,312, when in fact it is $23,948.20. ,020. I would just like to have that correction notice, and if council considers that tonight, when the agreement is brought forward for signatures, that would be, re be reflected in the actual final agreement. Does anybody have any questions uh, on those uh, amendments? Are we ready for the vote then? Yes, uh, I just take poll. Uh, council is accepting this as a friendly amendment. Uh, yes. Yes. No further uh, discussion is necessary. All those in favor? Opposed? It's carried. Thank you, Mr. Aquilina. Okay, the next item is item number six, and that's Councilor Demery. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Community and Corporate Services Clerks Division Report Number 2017-180, Subject Board Boundaries and Council Composition. Is there a seconder for the recommendation? Councilor Butters? Would this be for you to come in? Uh, someone has a question on this? I do. I do. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I just wanted to uh, be clear. The, the report is quite clear, and it lays things out very well. Um, I wanted to be certain that um, <coughs> my, my initial intent on in bringing this forward uh, was that we do create a committee 
and that that committee is struck in the new year um, to deal with the it wouldn't be the um, 2018 election it would be the, the election that follows that but uh, that that committee be given the time that it takes to properly go over all of the issues uh, around uh, uh, election matters electoral matters and uh, come back to council with a report so um, that's that just want to make sure that that committee does get struck and um, it didn't clearly lay, lay that out in the mo in the uh, motion that's why I do we have any the, comments on representation on that committee from the committee should be called for the same way that all committees are called for. Okay. There's a, you know, a, 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 of the public, certainly there would be a councillor probably on there, but uh, it would be driven by the public. Councillor Byron? Uh, just what Angie said, it should be, you know, citizens um, on that committee. That's what happened last time, that when they reviewed um, all those issues, and um, it was citizens plus maybe two councillors, I, I can't remember, but um, citizens for sure. Yes, please. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and through you. Um, at, uh, at the conclusion of the 2018 municipal election, likely after um, all of the processes have wrapped up from that, um, staff will bring back a report that will outline um, the committee as well as the le legislative process to go through this, um, it, it, you know, public consultation, those types of things. Thank you. That's exactly what I was looking for. Yeah, um, maybe we could use that as an amendment, uh, Mr. Demery. Can you uh, provide uh, some commentary in that respect? Okay, I would be happy to, to do that. Um, as the clerk uh, just uh, laid out, um, at the end of the conclusion of the 2018 election, um, staff would come back to council with a report that would outline um, a terms of reference for uh, a committee to discuss electoral matters. Is there a seconder for that friendly amendment? Councillor Butters? Call for a vote on the amendment. All those in favor? Opposed? It's carried. A call for a vote on the main motion. All those in favor? Opposed? That's carried as well. Thank you. Are there any notices of motion this evening? There being none, uh, I entertain a motion for adjournment. Moved by Councillor Dance, second by Councillor Kenny. Any discussion? Any none? All those in favor? Opposed? It's carried. Meeting is adjourned. We'll move into the regular meeting of Council 35 17. Well, on Monday, November 27th, the agenda is called to order, which I just did. The introduction of Benedictum items. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just to note, as I did during the Committee of the Whole meeting, that we had uh, an amendment to the um, uh, subdivision agreement for Meadow Heights. Um, and uh, as Council approved um, the amendment during the Committee of the Whole meeting, that, that uh, the bylaw will also reflect that change. Thank you. I entertain a motion to uh, confirm the agenda. Moved by Councillor Rodner, seconded by Councillor Elliott. All those in favor? Opposed? It's carried. Adoption of minutes. Uh, Madam Clerk, could you read those out for me? <coughs> for disclosures of interest. Are there any disclosures of interest? Are there any? There being none, it should be so noted. Mr. Mayor, do I have to declare that again since the delegation is finished speaking? My conflict? No? The clerk is saying no. Okay, thank you. Okay. No disclosures of interest noted. <coughs> Adoption of minutes, <coughs> Madam Clerk. Thank you, Mr. Mm -hmm. Mayor. Um, the special meeting of Council 33-17 uh, held on October 27, 2017, and the regular meeting of Council 34-17 held on November 14, 2017. Thank you. Determination of items requiring separate discussion. Oh, we have a mover and seconder. Mr. Elliott moved it. Councilor Butters, second. All those in favor? Carried. Opposed? Carried. You have a question? I, I still want to have a recorded vote on number one. Okay. Yes. The determination of iron. Yeah. Separate Thanks. Item number one. Is that
Yeah. Are there any other items needing separate discussion? There be none. You would like to vote on number one on the items, Madam Butters? Okay. <laughs> We'd like to call for approval of those items not requiring separate discussion. <laughs> Move by. Councilor Dan Dan Council Dan second by Council Jacet. All in favor. Opposed? Carried. Item number one now? No. Are there any proclamations? We have moved by Councillor Kenny on item number one, seconder. Councillor Butters, any discussion? Yes? I would, I, the discussion is I'm asking for a recorded vote. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Call for the vote. Recorded. Thanks. Um, there has been a request for a recorded vote. I'll um, read out the names of every member of council in alphabetical order, and then upon hearing your name, please indicate either a yes or no to the motion on the floor. This relates to the motion regarding a supervisor for the NPCA. Councillor Bodner? No. Councillor Butters? Yes. Councillor Danch? No. Councillor Demeray? Yes. Councillor Doucette? Yes. Councillor Elliott? Yes. Councillor Kenny? Yes. Councillor Main? No. And Mayor Maloney? No. The motion uh, carries with five in favor. Thank you. Okay, do we have any proclamations this evening? None this evening. Minutes of boards and commissions and committees. Minutes of the public library. Board meeting of October 3rd, 2017. Motion for approval of those minutes. Moved by Councillor Main. Seconded by Councillor Doucette. Call for a vote. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. Consideration of bylaws. Madam Clerk, could you read the law for me? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. That the following bylaws be enacted and passed. Bylaw 6535. 10217, being a bylaw to amend bylaw number 43101460602, being a bylaw prescribing on and off street parking for persons with disabilities within the city of Fort Colburn, bylaw 65360317, being a bylaw to authorize entering into amendment to the subdivision agreement regarding Meadow Heights sub subdivision, bylaw 65371417, being a bylaw to confirm appointments to the Accessibility Advisory Committee and the Environmental Advisory Committee. And finally, bylaw 65381057, being a bylaw to adopt, ratify, and confirm the proceedings of City Council at its regular meeting of November 27, 2017. Thank you. Can I have a motion to accept those or in bulk? Moved by Councillor Butters, seconded by Councillor Demery. All in favor? Opposed? It's carried. This, this time I'd uh, entertain a motion to go into closed session. Motion that we would now proceed into closed session in order to address the following matters. Applying and development report number 2017-170 regarding the potential sale of city-owned land pursuant to the Municipal Act 2001, subsection 239-2C, a proposed or pending acquisition or disposition of land by the municipality or local board. B, verbal report from the Chief Administrative Officer Regarding a potential property acquisition from the St. Lawrence Seaway Management Corporation land divestiture pursuant to the Missile Act 2001, subsection 239-2C, a proposed or pending acquisition or disposition of land by the municipality or local board. Please note the confidentiality of the supplementary information to be circulated to members of council with the agenda. Call for a motion to Move into closed session. Moved by Councillor Butters, seconded by Councillor Demery. All those in favor? Carried. We're now in closed session. 
Thank you very much, everyone, for being here tonight.